Okay, it's always a pleasure for me to knock this and see Commissioner Weaver's face as I'm knocking. Uh, it is February 17th, Thursday. Uh, welcome for open session. <clears throat> um, it looks like a relatively light open session, which is not a bad thing because we have some activities happening later on this afternoon. Uh, but before we start, as always, let's stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance and give ourselves a moment of silence and reflect. I think we have some standard processes that we have in place. We're going to go through Priority Carroll, have an update from uh, our wonderful Mr. Fowler, and then get an update on COVID from Ms. Sue Doyle. Uh, but before those updates, let's go through Priority Carroll. Commissioner Frazier, what's on your mind? We don't want to go into all that, but uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I say we had the let <coughs> make a legislative uh, committee meeting the other day. I have to say that they're getting shorter and almost it's almost down to two hours now, which was good. <laughs> we do have a lot of things to go over. There's a lot of discussion, really good discussion on the bills and so forth. So it is, it's, it's, it's a really good committee to be on. Also want to say, as everyone knows, COVID numbers are going down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's not over yet, but it seems that we're heading in the right direction. I'm hoping with spring, everybody outside, the numbers will dip dramatically even more. But that's just the hope I have. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Something about hope, isn't there, that we've heard that there's hope. That's right. Whatever. There is no hope. But the course of action is being <laughs> vaccinated hopeless. and doing the right thing. I have to say, I was at a meeting. I remember what, what meeting I was at, and the guy s talked about hope, and he said, hope is not a course of action. I said, wait, go what ahead. Who was that? <laughs> He's less than the, the Commissioner Rothstein. Wow. It is the truth. <laughs> wow. Okay, Commissioner uh, Wentz. I'm telling you, that's not what Eisenhower. It is what Eisenhower said, absolutely. That's not what he said. Anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, tail, tail end. Well, first of all, let me start off. Uh, I always like to honor those uh, that are no longer with us. Neglected last week to, uh, and I'm not sure when he did pass away, but Richard Dick Lindsay uh, was a longtime county employee here. And uh, he did, uh, Dick did a lot of design work and I was reminded last night at one of the meetings, I lost count of how many I was at last <coughs> night. You know, whoever said this was just a 30 hour job of kick, uh, shaking hands and kissing babies should have had their head examined. Anyway, um, Dick was primarily responsible for uh, the construction and the design of Carroll Community College and uh, did a lot of work here in, in the county. Uh, with with Carroll County government so uh, Dick just passed away uh, he was actually uh, close to in our district he was in uh, lived on Bachman's Valley Road uh, very nice gentleman I had the opportunity to work with him a little bit here uh, in another life when I was hanging around the halls here and we want to wish uh, our deepest sympathies and condolences to uh, to his family uh, today is also the uh, line of duty funeral for Wayne Fisher, who I mentioned last week uh, in Hartford County. Uh, I reached out to them, had a long discussion with, uh, with County Executive Glassman, and uh, that's happening at 10 a.m. today. <coughs> so uh, we want to wish the family the best there as they go through that as well. Uh, now, on to other things. Uh, Mako, yeah, it's getting interesting. I, Mike will have the bill count. That's always fun to hear. Uh, we did. Uh, we had a fairly long rural county call on Tuesday evening, and then uh, followed that up Wednesday with uh, a shortened version, but still lengthy. Uh, so Mike will, will touch on that. So uh, then from there, I went to uh, the Carroll Community College uh, meeting, and as most of you know, the budget season is rapidly approaching, 
So uh, I've got a lot of numbers to share and that kind of thing that certainly we're all going to be uh, privy to, but I, um, I got the, uh, the precursor, if you will. And then I left there and went to ESAC and heard about the things that uh, we need to start to look at when it comes to our fire and EMS department. And uh, <coughs> then I took a nap and came in here this morning. So it's been a, it's been a long uh, few days. Uh, I will give out the commercial again if you're looking for work. We have, what, 70 at least positions open in county government. Uh, you know, good pay, good benefits, so we're always looking for people to come here. And a reminder that the state of the county address is Tuesday at the Arts Center, and I'm going to leave it at that and go from there. So I'll nod off while Weaver's talking. Your beauty sleep did you good. <laughs> See, I'm nodding. See, I'm nodding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Commissioner Weaver. Okay, I just want to say, uh, if you really want to get some uh, uh, knowledge here, uh, show up Monday night at 6.30 at North Carroll High School in the auditorium. I'm having my community outreach and town hall meeting, uh, meeting the new owners of the facility. Uh, people in the community will be able to uh, we're going to give them a briefing get, ask questions question and answer period to find out exactly what's going on I want to dispel all rumors going around uh, it's not a free-range prison or a chicken farm or anything <laughs> else happening it, so they can explain exactly what's going on and as Commissioner Wayne said uh, Tuesday some uh, enjoyment in the morning for state of the county uh, it's always an interesting uh, event uh, and then um, I guess next week we have our joint meeting with the Board of Ed and I've been attending the Board of Ed meetings and this is a joint meeting here now I believe correct we changed it and we will be discussing as enough I think most discussions in the future here as Commissioner Wance alluded to will be about money and budget uh, it seems to be a hot topic this time of year <laughs> and everybody uh, needs money and uh, we don't have it but uh, aside <laughs> from that uh, that's it, a great it, starting point. <laughs> we don't have it. Uh, it, it it's, it's going to be interesting. Like so, you um, your kids. Uh, put it out that way and let it go. And uh, Mr. Wayne's still awake? Uh, yeah, good. We, yeah, we, good. We, we, don't, we don't want that headline in the paper. That woke me up. So. <laughs> um, Commissioner Boucher. Well, I was really looking forward to the free range chicken farm. <laughs> what happened with that? Not a chicken. Uh, Mr. Swam, do you have anything for me to bring up for the, uh, the people out there watching? While I'm waiting for something to come up, I want to read off we have here the BGE Energizing Small Business Grants. BGE is pledging $15 million to assist Maryland small businesses with COVID-19 relief and recovery funds. Eligible businesses located in BGE service area can apply for a $20,000 Energizing Small Business Grant. This grant program is part of BGE's comprehensive customer relief and energy infrastructure investment plan designed to help the state's economy recover from COVID. Eligible requirements, you must be for-profit business founded in 2020 or prior, between one and 25 employees, less than seven million in annual revenue, demonstrate a need for support, a strong plan <coughs> for moving forward, be in good standing with the state of Maryland. If you want any more information, you go to bg.helloalice.com. So if you're a small business out there looking for some relief, you can get there and, and apply for it. Here we go. We have Justin McGowan, our facilities maintenance uh, bureau chief. He is there standing at the boiler in the Mount Airy Senior Center. We're scheduled to replace that. There is so much mechanical stuff out there in the buildings that needs regular revolving maintenance. And he gave me a tour of the facility. They do a wonderful job, and it's so important to be in front of this stuff on maintenance because if we don't, it winds up costing us a lot more money in. So thank you, Mr. McGall. And look at these two lovely ladies, Angie Walsh, and, and the manager, and the assistant manager there. I forgot her name, it's so small, my eyes are gone. But these are the two ladies that help run the senior center in Mount Airy. They gave me a tour of the facility. They are such wonderful people there. They're so excited about the more and more people are starting to come out and utilize the senior centers as the numbers, as Commissioner Frazier mentioned, are coming down. And they're really ex very excited. And what a pleasure to have ladies like this serving our community. So thank you, ladies, for all you do. 
Also, want to talk. Oh, here we. I was out after last week's session. I went down to Gills Falls Park to go for a walk to relieve the stress because it can be quite stressful in this job. And I ran into these four gentlemen that work for facilities. They were out trimming the trees back. They have to do all the grass cutting. And this time of the year, they take the time to trim back the trees. They do annual revolving maintenance on our park. And that's Nathan, Lawrence, Tony, and Dawson. What a wonderful bunch. They enjoy working for the county. I always like to take the time to talk to these individuals and give them some recognition. So thank you, gentlemen. And this is the South Carroll Wrestling Team. They are champions. I'm not a wrestler. We have two wrestlers that serve on the board, and I'm sure they're very proud of them. On Saturday, the South Carroll Cavalier Wrestling Program represent the 1A North Region in the State Dual Championship at North Point High School. First up was the semifinals versus Harper Tech. The team took care of business with a score of 48 to 24 to earn a spot in the final duel against a very talented North Garrett team. Once again, the team came out on top with a final score of 45 to 25 to earn South Carroll their first ever state wrestling dual championship. Go Cavaliers. We have a lot to be proud of, and I'm hoping in the future we will work out something to bring these young athletes in with their coach and give them a little bit of recognition. So thank you very much. We're very proud of being representing South Carolina on the championships. You know, they were in the finals one other time. You know, who coached the team back then? Just a terrific <laughs> question for you. <clears throat> Seriously? Uh, Keep going. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, there we go. And I went out to Union Bridge. You had me thrown there for a minute. I actually didn't Silence. hear a word you said, so I'm a little bit lost on oh, that. Okay. But I went out to Union Bridge with Ed Singer, who works in our resource management department, to be briefed on a storm water management system that will be installed on the west side of Union Bridge to catch the runoff of the town before it goes into the Little Pipe Creek. I got to see the layout. Here's a little bit of uh, information on it. It shows the main street. And this is the, the location that shows all the world be running off. This is all part of our program to ensure this will be the location. There's Locust Street. That area will be where the stormwater management site is. And it will actually be on the opposite side of the creek from where they're going to have our kayak launch site. And while I was in Union Bridge, I had to stop in to say hi to Mayor Perry and Bill Kramer. Both these gentlemen, I took this photo and give them credit because Perry has served with the fire department as a volunteer for over 50 years, and so has Bill. Uh, Commissioner Wance is very familiar with these two gentlemen, all the years of service they provided, so I want to give them a little bit of recognition. We have such special people in all these small rural communities protecting us at a moment's notice. They jump up and go save people's lives. So thank goodness we have individuals like this throughout the county. So thank you very much. Okay. A um, couple things I... Uh, attended last week the kickoff for the Carroll Biz Challenge. Uh, Chamber of Commerce does a fantastic job in partnership with the community college along with businesses uh, within Carroll County to incentivize uh, those entrepreneurs and um, you know small businesses to come forward creating their business plan and creating um, opportunities for them to be recognized in Carroll County. Uh, of course, there's prize money that is associated with uh, the winners of the Biz Challenge, uh, and it's increasing uh, over time. Also, the recognition goes a long ways, as even if they don't win the Biz Challenge, they um, are recognized, and in most typical fashion, are the small businesses that we see and uh, you know uh, participate on ma on the main streets in Carroll County so good opportunity for uh, me to participate in that um, as mentioned we do have the state of the county address where all five colleagues or all five of us will be participating in sharing our uh, thoughts and views on how the state of the county is uh, is doing uh, and our future. There are some uh, housekeeping rules for entering the Arts Center. Uh, one was dealing with uh, vaccine cards. That's no longer uh, an issue as they've released that and that's uh, not part of the um, uh, requirements. However, there are requirements and masks uh, and arenas need to be worn 
uh, when not eating and drinking uh, inside the um, community arts center. So that is, you know, as of right now, and we'll see if that changes, but masks are to be worn by everyone. I would expect either the arts center and or the Chamber of Commerce to provide masks at the door uh, if you do not have one, but look forward to seeing as many as, uh, as possible in the Arts Center and uh, look forward to hearing from my colleagues as well. On the 23rd, we have a joint Board of Ed meeting in that afternoon. Um, we have a pretty good agenda where, like uh, it was mentioned, the budget is on a lot of people's minds. So I expect uh, that to be discussed um, during the uh, joint Board of Ed. I know redistricting is also on people's minds as far as uh, the schools, especially down in the southern part of the county, um, as they're starting to, to see uh, the challenges of, uh, of uh, the populations um, down there. The last thing before we get started, and I don't typically do this, but in national news, we see a lot of activity happening in international news with uh, what's going on in, um, in Europe and the Ukraine and Russia. And the reason I'm bringing this up is we have, I think, 8,000 troops that have moved from the United States to uh, Europe. So just keep them in your thoughts. Um, and, you know, not intending that they go into combat, but just being away and deployed and away from family is a strain on, on them, along with their families, neighbors, and friends. So, uh, you know, sometimes when we think it have it, we have it tough, you know, think about those that are being separated from uh, their loved ones, um, you know, in these challenging times. But I just wanted to throw that out there uh, as it seems to always be on my mind. Um, okay, without further ado, let's get right into it with uh, Mr. Fowler. Mike, why don't you come up to the table and share with us what's happening in Annapolis? Good morning. And I uh, understand brevity is the <laughs> point of the day, so I will take that to heart. Um, Where'd you get that from? <laughs> so we're approaching 2,400 bills, so that, that's quite a lot. Now the past probably seven to ten days, the, uh, the dates for submitting bills have come and gone. Uh, so anything that's submitted now has to go to the Rules Committee. And anything after March 7th has to have the rules suspended. So um, hopefully we're, we're coming down toward, toward the end of that. Uh, redistricting is, has taken a turn. You, you probably know that the filing, candidate filing deadline has been extended. <coughs> uh, there's a, I think a good summation in today's Baltimore Sun about uh, the challenges to the maps. Judge Battaglia, retired Judge Battaglia, I think has to, has said she's going to uh, determine by Tuesday whether these suits will go forward. So uh, that'll be the sort of the next date to look at. Uh, going over to, or, or moving over to our, our legislation, our MAKO initiatives, um, really nothing changes there, uh, with the exception of the, the governor's highway user revenue bill is is likely to fail and be replaced by the bill that MAKO really has proposed, um, which is actually more beneficial for the counties. Um, so there's another bill, a, a bill that's come forward that, that you all discussed yesterday in, uh, in the legislative committee uh, regarding property taxes for uh, community solar uh, generating sites and the term agrivoltaics. So agrivoltaics is defined as land that is able to be used simultaneously for solar generation and agriculture. So this would exempt from county personal property tax community solar equipment. And the way the bill's written is as anything installed prior to 2026 and then anything thereafter, so essentially everything. Um, if they're installed on, on land that's considered agrivoltaic, uh, brownfields, rooftops, landfill, and clean fill, that's a lot of areas. Um, it also accesses that agrivoltaic land as active agricultural land. 
It also mandates a 50% local property tax credit for any of that siting. Uh, and that would go for the entire life cycle of the installation. So um, MAKO is going to seek to make this, this tax aspect uh, authorizing. Um, but I know that the, uh, the MAKO policy analyst has a lot of deep concerns about this bill. And, uh, and, and a lot of it goes to uh, just the proliferation of solar bills in general and combine that with the climate bills. And so uh, there doesn't seem to be, at this point, a real focused effort around solar. Um, you'll see a little bit later, I think, a bill that, that tries to deal with that. Uh, another bill you saw yesterday, House Bill 979, the homeowner protection program. So th there is a homeowner protection program uh, that uh, people can opt into where the state will pay the tax lien um, and then deal with that homeowner. And so that satisfies the county tax lien. This bill would, uh, would move from an opt-in arrangement to an automatic enrollment by anyone. So that's a, a benefit to the counties. They, they get that lien satisfied. Also, another bill, uh, property tax bill, elderly individuals and veterans tax credit. So current law, locals can credit up to 20% with a duration of five years for that mm -hmm. credit. This bill would authorize local governments to determine the amount and the duration. So more flexibility for locals. And that got, uh, it's getting support. Um, I, I mentioned uh, in previous sessions, uh, House Bill 596, the Constitutional Amendment for Environmental Rights. Um, that has been trimmed back a little bit. The explicit right uh, to, to, uh, to sue has been removed from that. But I would suggest there's probably an implicit right uh, to sue. Um, so that, that bill is still problematic. Uh, it, it's really a referendum bill. So if the bill passes, it goes to referendum in the, uh, in the next election. Uh, and uh, it has had, now had its hearing in the Senate uh, committee schedule. Um, I've left the, the climate bills that we talked a little bit about last week on here just to keep them front of mind. Um, again, in today's Baltimore Sun, I think there's a good summation of the Senate hearing. Uh, the folks that uh, I, I think you can you can pretty much guess how things lined up. Uh, the environmental mm -hmm. advocates obviously um, were uh, were in favor of the bill, uh, but a number of groups came forward. Commercial real estate, obviously the utilities have some issues. Uh, some private companies that provide. Uh, heating oil and propane for areas on the eastern shore and in western Maryland. Um, so this is, I, I, I did hear the, uh, the, the senator, the, the chair and the sponsor uh, say that uh, this is um, sort of the extent to which he'd like to go, but it sounds like he will be open to, to some negotiation. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, cybersecurity was another issue we talked about extensively yesterday. Uh, there are four bills that were put forward by uh, Senator Hester and Delegate Pat Young from Baltimore County. Uh, I, I got a call from, uh, from Mark Ripper, our IT director, um, who leads the IT affiliate for MAKO, and they had met over the summer uh, to discuss a lot of these issues. And uh, they walked away from the table with an understanding that um, a lot of the mandates would not be forthcoming, that counties would be given a lot of flexibility, for example, in training, developing training programs for employees and implementing those plans. Um, and he was a little uh, concerned that none of those things were contained in the bill. They still contained all the mandates. But what we understand is there was some miscommunication from Senator Hester's office and the bill drafting folks in DLS um, so she is going to work with uh, the stakeholders to uh, heavily amend these bills. They may wind up uh, ultimately in one or, or two bills. So uh, I think that that's, uh, should put some of those concerns to rest. Uh, we've talked about the Kerwin-related uh, Accountability and Implementation Board. Uh, they are seated now, but this bill would change the composition of the board to give some more geographic representation. Right now, 
Eastern Shore, Southern Maryland, uh, Western Maryland is not represented on that board, and there are some concerns in, uh, in those areas that are unique and, uh, and probably should need to be brought forward. So the change there is it's got its hearing scheduled now in early March. How are we represented on that board? We're not. There, the, well, in, in terms of, is there someone from Carroll? Yeah. No. No. The bill, the way the, the it, it was set up was I think they said there were 21 applicants for 11 seats, I believe. Most of those applicants have come from the I-95 corridor. Yeah. Got whittled down to, to the 11, and they were, were seated. So, um, so out of that 11... How many are either Carroll, Allegheny, Garrett, Washington, Eastern Shore, Cecil? Zero. Cecil? Zero. Yeah, I, I, I don't know specifically, but I, I, I listened to the arguments that, that Senator Hershey made, and um, he didn't talk to the specific people that had been chosen, but he noted there was not representation from those geographic areas. But that's why this bill's there, so that you have at least four members from outside the people that are already there. You have someone yeah. from the yeah. Eastern Shore, someone from Western Maryland, someone from Southern and Northern. I, I'll Northern identify the Yeah, but I feel like, you know, like we're, we're putting a bill in to be seated at the kids' table. <laughs> well, I, I see what I you're I mean, you're, you're yeah. trying to get to the table, but you're still at the kids' table, and will there be attention? Yeah, and the, and the argument from I mean, Senator Pinsky was we, we had to choose from the... Oh. The applicant pool. Yeah. No one from those areas applied. So that's right. part of the challenge. Is yeah. You don't have anyone step up no, from those that's areas. Right. You yeah. can't be represented. Yep. Right. Yeah. Uh, another interesting bill, uh, Senate Bill 856, House Bill 1004, which would require each public school in the state to have a registered nurse. Uh, the, the issues that were brought forward on that, there were some counties that. Uh, staff their school nurses in a different way, for example, through the Board of Health. And during the pandemic, when the schools were closed, they were able to pull those nurses back and put them on duties related to COVID. So, uh, generally speaking, the the, uh, the body voted to op oppose that bill. There's also, a, a, obviously, a cost associated with that. Was that unified to oppose? Well, we don't talk about the individual votes, but <laughs> I would say well, it was overwhelming. It, it was overwhelming, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm against it, but I would have probably been one of the only ones. But I'm against it not because of obvious reasons, but I think it's really important to have a nurse in every school in today's world. But my argument would not have went very far because some heavy hitters had other things to say, and it all came down to money. Right. So I, did, I was quiet. And they also talked about the size, of, <laughs> the size of the schools. Some Shocking. schools are, are relatively small. And what they do, if they're closed, they share a nurse between two schools and stuff right. like that because it makes sense right. economically to do that. Does it, I mean, it would be better to have a nurse in every school. I'm not saying it wouldn't. Right. But you also have to look at the money that it costs to, to, to do that. If the school is relatively small, they, they don't see the bang for the buck, basically. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, you, you think of the Century High School student whose life was saved because the yeah. nurse was on hand. Fortunately, with uh, the ROTC, they were able to get, get the Woodbine, you know, fire there, and yep. this uh, this boy's life was saved. But it was because the nurse was there and knew how to do the AED and do everything. So, well, this is another example. If these bills there. come forward yeah. and there's some type of funding for these bills. They get a lot more support, but when his bills come forward, right. said you have to do it, and right. by the way, figure out how to find the money to do it in these tight budgets. It doesn't get a lot of support because the budget is extremely tight. Not that this is not a good idea. Right. You, should, you have to weigh it. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If it does go, we're, we're already set here, so that's yeah. why I didn't want to spend a whole yeah. lot of time on it. If we weren't, mm -hmm. then I would have been a little bit more mm -hmm. vocal. I don't think they, I, I'm, I'm hopeful the DOE and CCPS doesn't entertain taking nurses out of our schools. <laughs> I hope not. Oh, 
I'll leave it at that. Wow. And to be clear, I've never heard any talk about that. Yeah. But bills like this make people go, hmm. Yeah. It yeah. gives them an opportunity. Sure. Right. So, anyway. Okay. No, thanks. All right. Proceed. Uh, Senate Bill 795 and House Bill 1101. This is restoration of community college funding based on the CAVE formula. Uh, I saw uh, Dr. Ball, I guess a week, week and a half ago, he was very happy about this <laughs> one, uh, and they scheduled the hearing there for early March. Uh, cannabis, that's the next big Before issue. Before you go there? Yes. Talk about the uh, other education bill, which I, which you, I talked about this last time, House Bill 758, and you got me the bill, and I do appreciate that. I just want to bring this up again because what it does, it does say that the um, textbooks, other reading materials, videos, websites that you're going to visit, all that stuff has to be posted online for any, any class that you're teaching, uh, plus all of your lesson plans. Now, it doesn't, uh, what it doesn't say, so I was mistaken last week, the lesson plans don't have to be posted in advance. They just have to be posted so everyone can see them. This is a bill, in my opinion, to censor teachers and control what they're putting out. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, if you want to know what textbooks your child is using, what videos they're, wa they're watching, all you have to do is ask them. I don't know what the relationship between parents and students are, but just ask your child, can I see your textbook? What websites were you going to? What videos did you watch? What happened in school? That's, that's all you have to do. Bill's, this is a useless bill <laughs> trying to intimidate teachers, in my opinion, yeah. to, to, to toe the line exactly what the, whoever put this bill out wants. And this is, Surprisingly enough, um, taken from a uh, bills like this that are put out in Republican states, and of course the people that signed on to this bill are, all, are mostly the Republicans down here. And as I mentioned before, um, our uh, delegate Rose, delegate Shoemaker, and delegate Krebs have all signed on to this bill. I, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but <laughs> you send the teachers, like I said last time, they're in school for four years. Then they have to be certified, they have to continue education, then you get your master's degree, you could still have to take additional courses, but we don't trust you to teach in the classroom. We want to see everything you're doing. It's an absurd bill. I don't think it's going anywhere, I hope it doesn't, but I actually think we should write a letter against it and, and submit it, because it's, it's, if this doesn't go anywhere this year, someone's gonna bring something similar up next year. You can almost guarantee it. Is it getting bipartisan support at all? I don't think so, but. What's the status of that, Mike? Yeah. I, I haven't looked, frankly, because I don't believe it really has a chance. Uh, okay, because it's no point writing a letter unless it gets signed or gets a hearing. All right, yeah, we well, it, will, it will get a hearing. Okay. Oh, it will? It will? Every bill gets a hearing. It's uh, okay. probably wouldn't get out of committee. Yes. I'll, I'll emphasize this is an election year, so we'll all see more stuff like this. Uh, yeah, it, and we so should tread lightly sometimes. Yeah, from from my perspective, so I think this is a, more of a statement than an actual effort. Yeah, I, I think it is to too. But I think along. we have to make a statement against it. That's my my feel. I don't think this bill will pass. I don't think it will. And I know it's election year, <laughs> which is maybe a reason we, these Republicans brought this up. But I just think it's. Use your word. I'm a absurd, Bill. <laughs> and, and it should be there. And I'm hoping. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I just think we should make a statement against it. That's what I believe we should do. Uh, I mean, draft the letter, we'll sign it, to opposing this bill for, for the hearing. I mean, if that there's a sense of censoring teachers, I am completely against that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting tired of people not trusting teachers throughout this pandemic saying how teachers were taking advantage and going on vacations and you know teaching with their flip-flops on and all this other garbage I mean there's a level of maturity that we've got to you know have when we're looking at our teachers and putting our children you know in their hands and I have a very high high respect for that so I, I agree with you um, we don't do it with other professions you know we're not no. doing it with medicine we're not doing it with you know I mean they're so so if this is to curtail teaching then we got a problem I mean so I, I, I agree with you I just um, I, my thing is I'm not sure what the also what the value if there's a value in doing it then I'm all for it the um, 
keep in mind this is the worst time in the world. You can't hire teachers, you can't right. hire nurses, right. you can't hire anybody. So now you want to go in and add something like this to it? Why bother with that profession? If the, you know, and then as you know as well as I do, your curriculum in September is going to change by February or March. You're going to have to adjust things. Oh, yeah. It's not going to stay what they put out there. And somebody's going to try to hold accountable. Well, it was published in August that this is where you should be here. It doesn't work that way. There's too many other things happen. So uh, if you want to, uh, no problem. As long as we have the right details and everything, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I would, I would guess if you ask me to guess, I would say that Mabe would probably oppose it. I would think. Yeah, and certainly, I would think they would too. Maryland State Education Association would certainly yeah. be at the table. They have an awful lot of influence. Yeah, that might. I mean, that might be a better way to do it. Is if they oppose it, we could sign on, see what they say, but sign on to what they say, because they'll probably have a well thought out comprehensive reason about why not to do this except you know I mean then we could say okay you know the Carroll County Board of Commissioners agrees as well something like that I'll, I'll well, take whatever why, direction you want yeah why don't we do that why don't we wait and see what how they line up yeah yeah and we'll come we'll come in with that okay and, yeah just keep your eye on it to see you know instead of just putting it out there and kill them I think that's a good idea right I believe it So, cannabis, <laughs> the next big issue. Um, I've given you some details on, on the bills. Um, let me just set up in the beginning. So, the Speaker of the House indicated early on she would prefer a strategy that takes the issue of legalization and decriminalization to referendum. And should that pass, then begin the work of putting together a program to, to take it forward, beginning with next session. Um, that's not the way her chair of the Judiciary Committee has chosen. He's developed a bill that really sets up the full legalization and, and regulation regime for this. Um, it also would, in, would include setting up conditions for the release of people incarcerated for low levels of possession and then basically decriminalize possession uh, going forward. So that did have its, its hearing uh, earlier this month, or, the, or I should say this week. Um, the, the, the two Senate bills are, are actually more expansive because they bring in local governments. They give lo local governments the authorization to prevent these uh, retail sales locations in your county. They also authorize you, if you choose to cite them, to charge uh, up to 3% local sales tax. Um, also, specifically says they have to adhere to planning and zoning regulations. So you do have authority in here to deal with the issue as you see fit. Now, will any of these bills pass? That remains to be seen. I, I'm guessing if leadership has their way, they probably won't. And we'll get some more simplistic bill that just puts the issue on, on the uh, on the, on the referendum uh, for the election and then move forward from there. But when these other hearings come up, we'll be watching them closely because they do go into much more detail and, and particularly on the local government's uh, piece of it. Mike, and Mike yes. quick, quick question. Um, if the 3% local sales tax uh, were to occur, would that be for the end user, uh, would that be a total nine percent? Like, because the state would still have a six percent sales question. tax, and then the county could have up to three. Actually, I think the states uh, in here, I think the state can go higher. Yeah. I think they can go as much as ten, I believe. And then the three would be on and top. And then the three on top the, of that. Right. Whatever. The, oh, interesting. Well, I like the concept of the the revenue, the local control, and I also like that the part about the expungement of some criminal convictions because I know that 
this charge has disproportionately affected the minority population, and that is restricting a lot of the minorities from getting jobs that they they'd like, but say they have a possession of having a joint or something, and it restricts them. So if we can reform that, that would be very helpful for minority employment as well. Exactly, yeah, and these bills have a big component around, uh, you'll, you'll remember in the medical cannabis uh, license granting <coughs> controversies where there weren't enough um, minority applications, or, or the, I should say leases weren't, or the licenses weren't granted to enough minority uh, applicants. So that there are a lot of uh, a lot of the bills speak to the granting of licenses and and uh, uh, and, the, and 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 they contain yeah. the jurisdictions that have a larger minority population. This will have a greater impact upon them and their employment too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, that's the intent. Uh, also, a, a bill that is uh, back from last year in, in, in some form, uh, Public Information Act and records related to police misconduct. It prohibits the, uh, the county from charging a fee for the first 500 pages of a record uh, related to police misconduct. There are significant resources required for that. It's not just uh, printing 500 pages of material. It's all the redacting and reviewing that goes along with that, so that, that's got a hearing scheduled. Um, then a couple of bills here where there are some, some changes in the behavioral health crisis response services uh, where they want to prioritize health, uh, behavioral health responses over police responses to this mental health crisis. They were able to amend that language to minimize law enforcement rather than, uh, than prioritize the health response over law enforcement. Uh, the Senate version did pass the House with that amendment, excuse me, did, Senate did pass with that amendment, so it's now over in the House for review. Um, and then the, the 911 omnibus bill uh, is uh, scheduled for a hearing in finance next month. The 311 system bill, so we heard that one yesterday, Senate Bill 749, House Bill 1003, uh, it would create a statewide 311 system, which is for emergent, uh, non-emergency calls. So you think about people calling in about, you know, having their trash picked up, street lights are out, water, water bill issues, that sort of thing. Uh, there are several counties in the city of Baltimore that now have those 311, and their intent really is to take uh, strain off of their 911 centers. Uh, this would. Uh, establish a statewide system. It would allow the counties to keep their 311 systems, but uh, if you choose not to, you can opt into the state 311 system. Uh, so it creates a 311 board. Uh, there's a lot of representation from uh, from uh, two two reps from urban 911 centers, two from rural 911 centers, and a make a rep. And we're asking for a little more uh, participation in that. Um, I know there's some concerns that Scott Hamill raised to me about how those emergency calls that may find their way in the 311 system, statewide system, get transferred to the 911 system in a timely manner. Um, my guess is, I, I look at a lot of the language that the board will be go, be putting together all the, the regulations and, and structure of how this will happen. So I'm confident that kind of thing will be addressed in that. Uh, a bill to classify 911 dispatchers as first responders and emergency responders. Uh, that is going to be supported. That it, it doesn't go to any tax or retirement enhancements. Uh, it's things like uh, I, the first one I saw was in the alcohol provision of state law where there are organizations that if 51% uh, of their members are first responders, they have a certain benefit in their, their alcohol license. So they would be included in that category. Uh, service animals, they would be included. So it's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, a, go a good thing, as it was, as it was described. And um, last, a bill that you recognize, Commissioner Wentz, uh, House Bill 1052, gas piping systems, where it would require or eliminate flexible plastic piping um, in, 
inside a residence uh, or residential or commercial um, and require steel piping. Um, so I would suspect that the only people that will have an issue with that will be builders <laughs> and they'll, they'll be part of that conversation I'm sure. Yeah, so those, that, that piping has been determined to be directly responsible for a couple line of duty deaths over the last year or two. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the chief of Frederick County called me and said, "Hey, can you get get a little bit more involved in getting the right folks and you know on board with this?" So that's why I brought it up yesterday at Mako, and we'll see what they do. I don't know. Sometimes they don't want to do if it's not impactful, as you well know, Mike. But I think this one's impactful, so I hope they I hope they uh, they honor my request and and take it. So, so we'll see. So is this pipe leaking? Or is it causing, or is it, if there's a fire already there, this would more likely to explode? Or Actually, it's been determined that uh, when lightning hits a building, it, it provides a chase for it, and it, 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 uh, it attracts it and provides that uh, avenue for the lightning strike, if it hits on the roof, to end up it. in the basement. And then that's why they determined, because the last, Lonnie Duty in Frederick County, and there was one in Howard County as well. Uh, they went in on a on a house fire and found out it was full blown basement fire and fell through the floor. So, and they've determined that this is one of the most prominent avenues of travel for lightning strikes. It's like flex flexible piping or, mm -hmm. the, or the steel. The flexible. flexible. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, but yeah, that, yeah. Counter yeah. So anyway, we'll see where well, it goes. But I, I, I'm hopeful that uh, I told mm -hmm. Sanderson he owes me one anyway. So we'll see. Well, one of the aspects of that too is a, a lot of gas emergencies and and sometimes gas explosions are from people that don't connect appliances properly. Right. And yeah. that's what they're using to make yeah. the connections in the outdoor pipe. Like hooking up a gas dryer, so that's, that's probably the number one. I, thing. Exactly, mm -hmm. I had the same situation. You have steel piping, but the actual connection is that flexible tubing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I did it right with Teflon tape and Absolutely. soap for leaks and that sort of thing, but if you don't do that, yeah. which a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, there's some real horrible you, tragedies you, over there. Yeah, and you of all people would know that, Mr. I know. Bauer. <laughs> Precisely. Precisely. Can you uh, <clears throat> do me a favor, different topic, and um, when the uh, delegation talked about the bills, you know, and you and I and Mr. Burke participated. Can you uh, provide me the uh, the vote, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, who voted for, against, and or abstained, okay? Yes. On the different um, recommended bills. I will. I would appreciate that. So okay. I hope that was brief. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything uh, more for Mr. Fowler? Hearing none, I appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Doyle, wonderful seeing you in person. I'm here changing it. I don't see <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm not running around with my hair on fire anymore, I think. <laughs> That's more of it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see if I can remember how to do that. It's, a, it's like magic <laughs> when you get here. <laughs> how magical. And then I can move it. Who's driving? Do you, if you want to drive, Chris is driving. Just, driving. I just, I don't need yep. any help. Yeah, I just have to help myself. I am driving. We were not aware she was coming in person today. I've got it. <laughs> Sorry. The voice from above. So this is our update for this week and I get to smile because it's a positive update and we're moving in the right direction Good. and we're moving there quickly. Um, so our statewide positivity is down to 3.5. Hospitalizations are significantly lower, like 40% in a week. So these are all great numbers. Our local data, next slide, is um, improving. So we've had 194 positives since last week's report. Our positivity rate is 7.1, so we're trending right down there. Um, we did have three deaths since the last week's report, and the deaths, um, I do have to remind everybody that the deaths do lag, so sometimes the data changes from week to week, and you'll see that. Um, and that these positives don't include at-home test kits. Um, some states have 
a mechanism where they're collecting them um, um, on a more regular basis. Maryland has um, a QR code and a website where you can enter them, but there's no real obligation to do that when we get these tests out. Next. Um, so our data for the 6th through the 12th um, is showing um, that the positive antigen test and the probable cases um, and the at-home test kits are not included, of course, at 223, which is moving in the right direction. Like you can see a couple weeks ago, we were, what, eight weeks ago? Not even eight weeks ago. Five weeks ago, we were at 1600, so we're, we're doing well. Um, we are still considered in high transmission, which is why we're still recommending mask in place where you can't socially distance properly or that there's not um, six foot not and, and there's not better ventilation so mm -hmm. we are still recommending that next um, the hospital data for the first for the second time ever it flipped where we had more deaths um, not more hospitalizations in fully vaccinated people and less hospitalizations in non-vaccinated people um, you can see that little flip we did last week. Um, not really sure what that's about yet. Um, there is a lot of, you know, trans high transmission with fully vaccinated people right now. Next thought, slide. If I can, I thought the reason for that, from what I was reading. Oh, did they, they did the, yes. Is the number of people that are fully vaccinated. It has you increased. have a much larger pool to draw from, therefore, most likely, just by simple mathematics and statistics, more people will will you know contract it so and, and move for it there's a couple of things that have happened with data this week and i did tell commissioner mm -hmm. ralstein that i was going to get into this a little bit um one report we received this week highlighted and said oh we we've done some corrections for reinfection um so that was interesting we've also heard um just last night so i've been since 6 30 this morning trying to catch up on all of this that um the immunet data, which is how they do the COVID dashboard in the state of Maryland, is not as comprehensive as they first thought. It does not include vaccinations that occurred in other states or on military bases and things like that. So apparently behind the scenes, they've been working to get that data um, in, in the, the data set that they're gonna release. Um, and that is how what happened with Anne Arundel County Schools um, w was able to get a copy of their data ahead of time and saw that their um, rate of um, their vaccination rate for the five plus um, population met the 80% threshold, which is why they are have moved to go <clears throat> no mask. So that, of course, means I've had multiple emails and phone calls this morning. <laughs> We're at 77% based on the data that I have. So I, I just wanted everybody to know that I've communicated that. I do not think that they corrected the data overnight. They were working to, but I was told that they didn't think they were gonna have it done. I looked at this morning's report and this morning's report looks pretty much standard with yesterday's mm -hmm. report. And I wouldn't expect a significant change um, until they make this data correction. Um, when I find out more about that, I will definitely let everybody know. But um, at this point, I've just been told that to expect the data to change. Um, and maybe significantly in some areas more than others. Mm -hmm. So these are our ICU beds and our acute beds that are being used for COVID. And you can see this is a great place to be. There's very few of them right now being used awesome. for COVID. Um, next slide. Um, our, our deaths, we had um, the deaths of, are, are definitely trending down and we've only had four deaths total added since last week's report. Um, the majority of the deaths do continue to be in um, unvaccinated or younger ages, and I think that's on the next slide. Um, it breaks down the ages. So not fully vaccinated, there were 44. Um, 13 of those occurred in the 40 to 59 age range um, and 31 in the older than 60. Fully vaccinated and not boosted, there were eight deaths. They were all over the age of 60. And fully vaccinated and boosted, there was one under the age of 60, and all the other ones were over the age of 60. 
Um, and you are absolutely correct, Commissioner Frazier. We have a very high rate of um, vaccination in the older um, popu in the over 60 population. It's like 99 percent. Um, next slide. So our, our vaccinations as a whole are at 76.8 percent, almost 77 percent have had at least one dose. 71.7 percent are fully vaccinated, and about 50. 4% of those who are fully vaccinated have received either a third dose or a booster. That's the number we're, we're looking to increase. That's the number the state's looking to increase overall. Um, as I said, so when we look at the data, you have to be really careful that you're comparing apples to oranges or apples to apples because there's been some questions about what the state um, board of education meant by the eligible population versus your population. So if it's the eligible population, it's five and above. And if it's the entire population, you see we're about at 72%. Um, if it's over five, we're at 77%. So that's gonna be, I, I, apparently it's um, up for debate right now what was meant. Apparently one thing was said verbally and one thing is in writing. So I, that's not my fight, that's somebody else's fight. And then um, next slide, we're, we're Moving, um, oh, here's our rates of vaccination, and here you see 99, 95. Um, as you go down, you see um, they're less vaccinated. The five to nine population is the five to 11, actually. Um, this is just the way the data gets broken down. The only way we can access it is during it in these age groups. Um, so you can see that that's the population that has the lowest, but they've also only been able to get vaccinated since December 3rd. So we're not looking at a very um, high number. Next slide. We um, are, are seeing case decreases across the state and country and the CDC metrics are gonna be changing again. I just want you all to hear this from me. They've been out there, they briefed the White House yesterday on what they think the new um, items we should be looking at now that we have the majority of the population vaccinated. They're starting to look more at our hospitalizations and less at um, the transmission rates is what they're talking about moving away from. So over the next few weeks, we um, I'll probably have stuff to share on what the CDC is recommending and where the state of Maryland is going and what the school system is going. Um, but we're still recommending because right now the guidance we have is to, to go by the transmission rate that we still are in high transmission and we're recommending to wear a well-fitting mask when in public and around people at high risk to avoid crowds gather outdoors as much as possible, postpone travel, test when symptomatic, and uh, receive all your recommended vaccines. So um, the next slide I think talks about what we're doing right now. So our vaccines are afternoon and evening clinics for ages five plus. Um, we had our first walk-in last week out of a five-year-old um, to be vaccinated, so that was exciting. It was not somebody who was scheduled. They actually walked in with their family. Um, our testing center is moving today back to the health department. Um, we're, um, um, the Ag Center has a um, bull riding competition mm -hmm. and we decided this was a very good time for us to move because we're only seeing about 50 people a day over there. So we're moving the National Guard over with us and we're gonna um, do that from there. Test kits are going out through the library. This week we did receive about 6,000 test kits from the state. So there's a uh, three times amount what we've been getting um, in addition to that and I don't want to say this out loud because I don't want to jinx it but I will we're supposedly getting 52,000 test kits tomorrow if that happens they will all be going to the libraries and then next week we are to get the second batch which should be a hundred thousand and those I'm working on a plan to get them out into the community and not just have them warehouse somewhere I want to make sure that people can get to them and it's not just at one place um, masks are continuing to be dis um, distributed. We had 20,000 masks come in last week. They were packaged and out the door to the libraries. I know that um, most pharmacies you can get them. Um, I know Safeway had them out on display. Just you could pick them up down back by their pharmacy area. I know that I'm being pushed out communications from almost every pharmacy in Kilkenny that they now have test kits available. Um, which is fine, but ours are free and we're gonna get them out and we're gonna make sure people have access to them. And then I think that was my last slide. I could be wrong. Um, 
So all good news, all trending in the right direction, all going where we want to go. Um, I know that everybody wants a break. Everybody wants to be good for a while. Um, we're coming into spring. If we can keep going in the direction we're going and there's more outdoor activities, I could foresee, you know, nobody has a crystal ball and nobody has a magic wand. So if we did, we'd have fixed this by now or we'd have known what was coming before it was. So we're looking at some other opportunities. Um, there's a, a pilot or a, um, opportunity to work with NATO on some wastewater um, um, testing, um, which has been used and recommended by a lot of other states and a lot of other um, scientists. So I think the city of Westminster has expressed some interest, so we're going to try to move forward with that. Okay. Any comments, questions? Well, I want to say thank you, Ms. Doyle. It's pleasant to see you happy and less stressed. You have been on a long, hard road for two years. <laughs> yes. So seeing you smile is a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank to, you. To um, oh. be clear, Carroll County government has never put mandates on the Carroll County community, full stop. We had mandate in place for a short period of time that was in line with our governor's mandate for our government facilities. That has been lifted. So we have never put mandates in place. The mandates that are put in place currently in the public, in the private sector, it is up to them to do their own due diligence to make their decisions uh, as shop owners, as facilities, whatever they may be, to put masks mandates in place. Um, and it is our role to be respective of that, but it is not um, our role and nor have we done any mask mandates because we still get a lot of that traffic. Yes. The Board of Education makes the determination for the schools, not Carroll County government. Mm -hmm. um, although the Board of Education, some will say is a subsidiary, they are not, they are elected officials um, to make those decisions. Um, and we'll see where that goes, but for, for the school systems. Um, I just wanted to, because we have uh, a couple of events happening next week, and I'm saying this to the, mm -hmm. to the community, uh, not to you, Sue, but it's the state of the county and the Board of Education joint meeting. The Board of Education joint meeting is gonna be held here in the Reagan room downstairs and masks will not be necessary as long as we can maintain the social distancing uh, that's appropriate. So we are going to do our best to spread out and have that mm -hmm. opportunity. The Chamber of Commerce hosting in the Community Arts Center venue, the auditorium for the state of the county, the Community Arts Center has put mask mandates in place for the Arts Center. So therefore, we respect that in attendance and participation um, because there'll be a lot of folks there and then also in the auditorium, right? Okay, so again, uh, appreciate it. Um, I don't think the sciences have changed. I think the numbers are changing and I think doing due diligence uh, for all of us in Carroll County has gotten to us where we are. So I'm very proud of the direction we're going. Um, and obviously all the work that you are doing in teamwork with, with others. So um, is there any comments? No, you answered my question because it's all about Anne Arundel County now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, I woke up to like yeah. yeah and I was I and I've just been running since trying yeah. to keep up with it because people so have just been calling going can we do that and I'm like I I have to figure this out yeah I know the parameters were pretty clear mm -hmm. or they were very clear so they yeah. they met them so off they go uh, I'm surprised that, that they met them I mean Anne Arundel <laughs> has I mean not 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 that's not a negative comment, but they're, you know they're much bigger than we are. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of schools there, and a lot of you know a lot of people. So a lot of I'm just a little Montgomery County has done them. a fantastic job vaccinating their kids. Yeah, 
faster than any of the rest of the counties. We were all asking how they were doing that, Montgomery County. Oh. Um, but, you know, I also know that the parents there did a little bit more about looking for other resources and yeah. other places where they could get vaccines and not just, because, you know, at first all of these vaccines came out very limited. Right. And they were prorated based on our population. But right. that doesn't mean you couldn't have gone to another clinic in another area if you were willing to go. Um, so I think people were just a little bit more savvy and they could get to DC, I guess, too, very easily. And, so. and the mass vaccination sites in the early yes, they stages were, were Montgomery, Prince George's. In much uh, Howard, more populous areas. Yeah. Um, That's true. I didn't think about that aspect yeah. of it. So, well, yeah. so, I know we're close. So. We are, we are yeah. close very, very and close. it's, it's gonna depend on that metric and it's also going to depend on whether they interpret it as those eligible or the total population, so. Right. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's nothing I decide, so. Right. <laughs> well, I appreciate. Thank you so much. I just get to you. report the data. <laughs> I would just say I appreciate Commissioner Rothstein bringing up the mass requirement yes. at the Arts Council. I will not be attending because of the mass requirement. So if media wants to accommodate some sort of situation where I can read off my speech off that facility, I'm looking forward to being accommodated, but I will not be attending that facility with a mask. Thanks, Sue. Um, Citizen Service Celine, request approval for annual plan for fiscal year 2022 for Carroll County Bureau of Housing to the displayed to be displayed for 45 days. Okay. Sam, did you want to uh, kick this off? Or no, I think that's good. Okay. He will guide us and make sure we do it correctly. So. Good luck. <laughs> good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'm here before you today um, with Daniel Yates, our bureau chief of housing and community connections, and Paul Moffitt is also with us in the audience. He is our um, housing choice voucher program manager, uh, and we're before you today to review our updates for our housing annual plan. Um, for FY22 and to request to display that plan for 45 days for public comment. The Bureau of Housing and Community Development, on behalf of you, the Board of County Commissioners, administers your Housing Choice Voucher Program for Carroll County. Um, and each year we are tasked with looking at our annual plan and the information, it's very comprehensive, and the information that we have in that plan to make sure that it is meeting the needs of the community. Every year we come before you with some recommendations for changes that need to be made to make sure we're updating and meeting the, the needs of the community. So Danielle's gonna walk us through those recommendations. We did put in your packets and your binders, the specifics of those recommendations as Danielle's walking through them with you. Okay, so good morning, commissioners. As good Celine morning. noted, the fiscal year 22 annual plan updates reflect three adjustments to language related to our Section 8 Housing Assistance Program. In Chapter 4, which is titled Applications, Waiting List, and Tenant Selection, we have adjusted language in two sections. The first adjustment falls under the Special Admissions section. We have added language further explaining the mainstream voucher program eligibility requirements. Since this voucher program is still fairly new, HUD has released definitions around several key requirements of the program and this is the additional information that we have added for clarity. The second adjustment to language is in Chapter 4 as well, Local Preference section. We have adjusted language to clarify our agency's local priority preference for applicants that live and work in Carroll County. Our final adjustment is in Chapter 5, titled Briefing and Voucher Issuance, to accommodate for emergencies we have added additional sentence noting oral voucher briefings may be conducted telephonically or via any virtual meeting platform. Would anyone have any additional comments for us in regards to the adjustments to our administrative plan? As well, if you're unfamiliar with the plans that, were, that we have made or the adjustments, I do have copies here, which should also have been included in your packet. The vouchers that are provided, um, you know, the, the veteran vouchers, there's mm -hmm. 15. Yes. Have we used all 15? We have. We are working, we have one that we are actually working to lease up 
but the 14 already stuffed and being utilized. Are we going to be requesting more? I mean, I know we're doing a, a point in time homelessness, mm -hmm. and I, I do want you to talk about that for a second as well because Absolutely. the community needs to understand that clarification on who's out there and how we are doing our best to right. recognize the needs because there's a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, just different ideas and thoughts and we got to all work together on doing this because there are folks in need. Uh, and again, you know my passion besides all Carroll Countyans are veterans. Um, so the numbers have gone up or have they stayed the same or where are we at? Um, and how do we use the point in time homelessness with this? Can you kind of walk me through that? So as far as the point in time count that we do, of course, it's a mandated count that we do um, annually. Typically it's in the last 10 days of January because of COVID and how rates have fluxed so high we're able to go postpone 30 days to the end of February. So it's next Wednesday, February 23rd. We are doing what's called a sheltered and unsheltered count. So the sheltered count is of course the account that we take through all of the shelters that we have here in Carroll County. The unsheltered count is where we actually go on foot in that day. We start about 7 a.m. in the morning. We have eight teams and we go across Carroll County in areas where we may find individuals who are homeless and on the streets. We go through encampments that we know of. We work with the Sheriff's Department and other muni police municipalities, excuse me, to identify those encampments. We also go to all parking rides, your Walmart parking lots, um, all of our parks. It's just we have a team that goes together with outreach and we come up with the areas that we hit. And like I said, we have eight teams that will be throughout the county that day looking for our unsheltered and counting those folks and f completing a questionnaire as well. So, yeah, so again, if, um, if the newspaper wants to pick up on something that's very important to us, yes. this is something they should pick up on. And Absolutely. it's incumbent on Carroll County community that is aware of homelessness yes. to identify it and bring it to your attention so it can be put into the numbers to get the resources necessary Absolutely. to take, take care of Carroll Countyans. Again, um, my concern is that there are some that are, you know, on the side saying, I know more than you know. I say, I don't want you to know more than we know. I want us all to know together. everything together, together. Right. to and take care of homelessness. And I do want to also say, when, when we talk about the count, that we're going out and we're doing this count, it's much more involved in that. Like she said, there's going to be a survey. And, and the point is to talk to individuals who are homeless, to really understand the why of how they became homeless, how they came to Carroll County, um, and, and where they were before they became homeless. How long have they been homeless? These are very important pieces to the puzzle for us to work with them and work right. through where they've been so we can help them to become housed. Um, and so th that's the other piece of it, to understand the why. Um, the other side of it is also as far as working with our whole continuum of care, our Circle of Caring Homelessness Board. I, I just sent an email out to the distribution list. We have over 150 individuals throughout the community. These are other agencies, um, community members, faith-based partners, um, other, other um, state agencies, local nonprofits, you name it, soup kitchens that work with us very collectively to to really target the needs of our homeless population and I help us identify these folks help us go out on these um, counts help us to work on a daily basis with resources sending information out to the group as a whole to make sure people are connected to the resources we have in Carroll County and we have great resources here um, and, and again we do have some folks that are chronic homeless that are very difficult um, because they do not want to receive services and we have to continue right. to try to be creative and figure out <laughs> how we can engage them because we don't want anyone lost regardless of where they may be in their personal journey with homelessness and, and other barriers that they have to becoming stably housed. So. No, I appreciate it. No one, I apologize, just real quick, no one agency or individual has ownership on this identification and care and I appreciate the circle of care <clears throat> and work you're doing because <clears throat> it's got to be all of us 
we all got to work together to recognize the importance of homelessness that exists, why homelessness exists, and then how we are going to step up and minimize the homelessness that's in our community. I apologize. How mobile is that group? Do you have an idea? I mean, from one year to the next, same people, what percentage like trans stay? Trans yeah, so how transient? And what we can do, so as Celine said, we do a survey with every individual, and that's how we get our count. And what we do is we have, like she said, committees. So we have our chronic committee. And what it is is we look back several years to identify are there repeat individuals, which typically fall in our chronic. And we have a special group where we're, we're looking to try to identify markers that maybe are key indicators of why they're still homeless. We try to build those relationships and rapport and trust with those folks to get them to enter into services with us to help end that homeless stint. So, you know, we're constantly looking at the numbers. I know it sounds like running reports to see if, you know, our folks are recurrent as far as homelessness and then building the relationships to work with them to try to get them off the streets and into shelter. Is it half, third, what do, you, do you have any idea how many re reoccur? As far as through the pit count versus the repeat, I don't wanna get, I know with our chronic numbers, we're looking at typically about 40 individuals on our list that are chronic. Um, many of them probably have been, well, when you're chronic, just so you know, you had to have a stint of homelessness at least over 365 days or it's four occurrences within the past year. Mm -hmm. So typically those people are gonna be the ones we see every year with the pit. And about how many of those are veterans? Do you have any idea? As far as count for yeah. the day, typically we only get around, I think it's 60 individuals that are actually street homeless. Um, your unsheltered account, of course, because, or your sheltered account, excuse me, because it's gonna be your um, folks that are in the shelters is gonna be a little higher. It's usually about 100 and some. But asking specifically about veterans, right? Veterans. Oh, I think we we had just pulled a report of of mm -hmm. um, the past was it six months yes. of veterans that we had worked with, and we have worked with twenty homeless veterans over the past six months. Now some of them are housed now, right. so it, it's so in actually, you know the data ebbs and flows. Yes, right. so it's hard to pinpoint when you're asking these numbers. It's very hard to pinpoint, and that's that. why this point in time count. Sure. Some people don't love the point in time count because it's just a One snapshot day. of that day, right? right? And so you may have people that are hospitalized, you may have people that are staying on the couch sure. with a friend for that day that we, we have not identified. But there's a lot of things that, that fluctuate with that pit count but it is one, you know, it's required for us to do that. And it does provide us with a, a one day count where we actively go out as a team and make sure we're hitting all those different locations. Uh, if I may, I'm concerned about exposure of our personnel to biohazards and assault. Is there something that you're doing to prepare for this? Are they get an escort of a deputy sheriff? Mm -hmm. What is in place to make sure that air personnel are protected? So we have trainings okay. and then we also, what'll happen is We've had meetings amongst the, along the way, but um, next week we have one set up where we work closely with the Sheriff's Office and Westminster Police. They give us guidance as far as your do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. But then also the Health Department um, will give us like the, the current COVID guidelines and so forth. So we're kind of following those protocols and procedures. Yeah, um, I'm we're concerned only like using the exposure individuals. of needles, like if someone's an IV drug user in a camp and there's needles laying around. So as long as everyone's trained. Right. So we have hold harmless bags that we will be giving out, but also there are two um, actual primary contacts we have with the health department. So if we run into an individual, one who may need Narcan or to mm -hmm. transfer out, or if there are issues with biohazards, we can contact that day and they'll be out to take care of events mm -hmm. like that. As well, it's well. nice to know you guys are proactive on this because it'll be a tragedy if something happened to one of our personnel Absolutely. at one of these encampments. And we talk about that a lot. And also HUD puts out a lot of guidance surrounding this because it's a national count that is done. Right. And so there, there are always trainings online as well about and newest safety protocols and how to be safe while you're doing your counts. And I'm not sure if um, you all recall what we did. We were going to do our pit count a month ago and working with the health department with the COVID surge. And in that time we decided for the safety of our team, we were going to postpone that count Good. until next week. Thank which you ended up being a very um, wise Good decision. Choice. Yeah. You know, you do, we do a lot in Kill County due to you, I mean, on this whole area, and our veterans are definitely looked out for, I know that, 
you've made calls, I think all of us different times, uh, uh, you run across somebody on a Saturday, Sunday, whatever, they're handled right away. And I really appreciate your attention to that. And if I just have one second on this one, I just wanna, I got a call this for just the other day, elderly gentleman from, uh, uh, he was dealing with the Department of Aging Disabilities, could just raving about the <clears throat> person, I think it was Nicole, yes. spent time, four o'clock in the afternoon, she spent two hours on the phone with him, helped him get through the issues he had, and he couldn't believe county government helped him that well. And uh, I just wanted to point that out to us, but you do this across the board, it's just not that department, I know that, so thank you. Thank you for that. We'll make sure that Nicole knows yes. about that. She she is the new supervisor for our Maryland Access Point Information and Assistance, um, and she's been doing a great job. So that's good feedback. Did a great to have. job. So, um, I do want to say also just a reminder to everyone that we do have um, our night by night shelter now that operates year round. Previously, in years past, we had had just a cold weather shelter for cold weather months that served folks, but now we have been um, HSP operates that shelter going forward. Um, year round, which provides emergency shelter for anyone that needs it. We don't turn folks away. So if there is a need when someone comes into Carroll County and they need to be housed in, in, in an overnight situation to be out of the elements, we have that opportunity. And I think because of that, we have seen some more connectivity to people that we may not have worked with in the past, uh, where you ask about those numbers. So we are looking at the why to that. We've developed a new outreach survey beyond the pit count to really talk to the homeless individuals to say how do you know the same questions how did you end up homeless how did you get here what where were you before um what do you think your barriers are you know and, and what are your needs and, and a lot more detail in that survey and we're going to be looking at those going through the year as an executive committee in our continuum of care to really analyze that data to see how we can better impact folks and prevent working more on prevention of homelessness how's their success rate in bringing these people in and, and making them self-sufficient so people know out there that we're not just creating perpetual homelessness that we're actually trying to uplift these people with other programs get them in the job market I'm gonna let Danielle talk a little bit about our, our three new housing right. facility coordinator positions <laughs> that we hired this year as part of the COVID funding right. so what we've created is like Celine said um, three positions for housing stability so with these positions, they're willing, or they're willing and able to work with anyone who may be struggling at any point. So many of our folks who have received the ERAP, which is the Emergency Rental Assistance mm -hmm. Program funding, who have been struggling through COVID, begin um, working with our folks. And what they do is they're gonna make connections and resources um, for those individuals to different programs that can give them that support. It might be as simple as working on a budget um, looking at do they need food stamps, additional support through um, many programs that we have. It could be finding out if they need to make a simple application to our Housing Choice Voucher Program for assistance as well. They can make connections with that because many of our folks have of course lost their job or have lost income because of the type of jobs that they held through COVID. So we're trying to make those connections and carry them through um, to make sure there's stability. Um, we've seen a great success rate as far as exactly how much I, I don't want to over speak because mm -hmm. I'm not sure I just know that um, our stability coordinators have become valuable positions that assist many people within the community yeah. and the way it works is anyone whatsoever that may be struggling can be referred and we will work with them there's not a requirement as far as working with a specific program or someone else Many times we have people that just walk in off the streets. One of our coordinators will take them and we'll work through any of the issues that they have to make sure that we can get success there and independence. I'm not, I'm, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. And we connect them with mental her, uh, health Absolutely. and addiction services as well because that seems to yes. be the impetus that puts them in that situation. Absolutely. So what we do is um, they sit down one-to-one -one with the folks and they're going to go over um, many questions that we have to answer to see what the barriers are that they might be experiencing and based on what they share is where we make those referrals and connections within other community agencies thanks for sharing that with the public because it's so vitally important for the public to understand exactly what you're doing because i hear that whole thing like oh you're just perpetuating homelessness no we are not we are showing compassion to these individuals to uplift and turn their lives around and i commend you both and all your staff for what you do it's vitally important for our community to recover from this pandemic and you're an incredibly important part of that. 
Thank you. The, uh, well, I'm not sure what Burke is, but I do know what the Workforce Development <laughs> Center is. Um, but, uh, and I appreciate the work you're doing uh, with that. I did that for the ladies in the back. But anyway, um, you know, it, it's kind of like um, getting folks out of confined spaces, out of jails and prisons. We don't want the recidivism, you know, to exist, so we're, we're minimizing it. And you're using all the tools um, at your disposal my biggest concern is that there are still others out there that want to do what's right and um, are participating and I want this circle to be complete and continue to bring folks into the mix because no one has the answer all of us together will um, and then my last comment is what else do you need from us I mean you got the advocacy from us you got the support with those positions is there more and it's not necessarily now but maybe something to go back to um, and say these are the things we want more of uh, in order to to really minimize this so and, and I think as we're looking at that and we have you know every month we meet as an executive committee mm -hmm. as well as then every other month we meet as the full circle of caring but we we look at where we are as far as some of the COVID funding and some of the rapid rehousing resources that we've been Absolutely. given that we typically don't have each year, right? And how that funding right. is coming through. And right now, we're going to be receiving additional funding through ERAP around two yep. um, for some additional rapid rehousing as well. Um, Absolutely. So looking at, the, at that, when we're planning for years out, you know, the funding is there now. It's there. It's going to be there for the next several years. But further out, what does that look like for us? If that, if those numbers for rapid rehousing units are not going to be available past a certain year, what do we need to plan for? Where, where do we sit? So that's going to be um, a, a big piece of how yeah. we, we analyze our data and try to make those determinations and, and what that will look like for us if we don't have those funds anymore. I appreciate you taking the tangent and talking about this because it's important. And knowing that we just did the press release for the um, uh, point in time contact uh, it, it ties together really well it nests really well but getting back on uh, topic <laughs> I'll move that the Board of Commissioners approve the display of the annual plan for 45 days for public review and comment also announce a public hearing prior to April 7 2022 to consider approval to submit the FY 22 annual plan to HUD second okay Got a motion, got a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing, hearing none, all in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Okay, thank you, ladies. Well, thank you, Commissioners. I want to state that this week or last week, I was out walking at Crim yes. Gold Park and I ran into Miss Yates out there walking her dog, her two yes. daughters. They have lovely dogs. Thank you. You set a good example after walking. Keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, speaking of Burke, or at least workforce development, let's have Carroll County Workforce Development staffing recommendations to enhance the citizen and business services. Ladies, long time no see. <laughs> Good morning. Good, Good morning. 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 If I could just take one second and just acknowledge um, the work that they're doing at Citizen Services with homelessness and the rapid rehousing. We are in a conversation with the Grants Office and Celine's team about how we integrate workforce into the people that are receiving those services. Um, and the unfortunate circumstances that lead people to homelessness. Um, also, they're living in the moment and it's, it's really hard to have everything in place to move forward sometimes. So the key is engaging people where they are in the moment until they're ready to take the next step forward. So just wanted to share that that's one of the things that we're working cooperatively with. And, Thank you. you know, as, as shared yesterday um, on the Governor's Workforce Development Board, it is to minimize the recidivism of those incarcerated. It's the same, you know, in respect to those that are homeless, to get them out of homelessness and keep them out of homelessness and minimize that as well. So. Um, Okay. Very good. Well, thank you You're for done. having us here today. We would, wanted to update you on uh, the programs and services at Carroll County Workforce Development. As you know, we did the rebranding um, probably last month. And um, I do want to thank Commissioner Rothstein for attending the, um, I think it was the third meeting of the Carroll County 
Workforce Development Board, so he was able to share his work and experience with the Governor's Workforce Development Board and also you know, his vision for what our local board could do um, here in Carroll County. So that was very helpful. Thank you for, for being yep. there. So the board, you know, represents uh, many of our industry sector partners and also um, our workforce partners that are here in the community. I think we have a, a good board and they're very excited. So we did share the new uh, branding and logo with them yesterday. Um, we also talked about, you know, the mission and some governance issues for the local board as they get started. And we shared with them some information about the programs uh, that we have and some of the customer uh, data that we're collecting at the Workforce Center. So uh, moving on to the welding training program, um, I wanted to give you an update on that. I know Commissioner Boucher has been over there and very supportive of what we've been doing. So we had our third cohort that started on Monday. And so there are eight uh, individuals that are in that training program. So that's, again, moving along very well. Um, so to date, we've trained 32 um, individuals in the welding certification and uh, the training program with Earl Beck Technologies. Um, that includes 16 employees of Carroll County government that we were able to train as well. So that's moving along. It's been so successful. Um, that we've had, I know at least one person was hired by a, a <coughs> BAFCO. We're connecting them with the local businesses as they come out of the program. The business reps are coming in, meeting the candidates, and making them job offers. Um, so there have been a placement at a BAFCO, a placement at FR Conversions. Um, and then we actually have some individuals that are going into business for themselves, and so they're we're connecting them with small business development uh, support with that. Ms. Peter, are we attracting uh, minorities and females into the program? Yes, actually, there. You, I think you were there with the last cohort, and there was uh, a female who was, I think she was the individual that was in business for herself, and then there was another minority that was represented there in that cohort. So, yeah, I think she was probably the best welder too. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, it, it's females definitely. Females tend to have very good manual dexterity. Yes. that is in excess of the male ability. Yes. So, so that's been good, and we did do, I did do a little write-up for the Maryland Department of Commerce that they shared, so we got some statewide recognition that we're doing this program, and, and that's going very well. In fact, uh, the, there, we have enough people that are interested in a fourth cohort in April, so that will be April 18th. Um, I think after that, the trailer needs to go to Virginia for some other training down there, but we're talking about bringing it back in the fall. So that's going very well. Um, the other new training program is the CDL driver training that uh, we're standing up with Carroll Community College. So that program is going to start on March 14th, and we're recruiting individuals for that training program right now. Um, and they'll get a commercial Class A driver's license. It'll be an eight-week training program. So uh, that one's going to uh, be starting, as I said, on March 14th. That, so. legisl that uh, law just changed, didn't it, first of February, that they have to have training weeks of training prior to receiving um, CDL. Yes, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. And so, Perfect I time. mean, we're hearing yeah. from local companies, obviously, mm -hmm. they need, you know, the uh, commercial Class A driver's license. So that's another uh, successful training program that we're standing up with Carroll Community College. Yeah, so. I know. I, I spoke with Dr. Ball, I think it was last week, and he's very um, yeah. appreciative, enthusiastic about this specific program. So Yeah, so it I is, and the difference is um, typically the company they work for, they're going down to Baltimore City for training, so that the classroom training is going to happen here in the county. We're still trying to work out a location, location. Right. for right. the driving. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He and I were talking, uh, you know, maybe up um, the new Random House up in uh, Hampstead location. Uh, there are large parking lots up there. Mm -hmm. um, there is concerns of where you're going to do it, but. I think we're going to find space. Yeah, we put them in touch with Thank a you. couple of those um, property yeah. owners. So Airport yeah. was, he was another one that's potential, but yeah. yeah. So, so we're okay. very excited Thanks. about that. That's that's another mm -hmm. new program that we're doing. So we were updating um, the board about that and just wanted to bring you up to date. The other program that we've talked about before is the Premier Virtual uh, Job Fair that we're hosting. We did one in January. Uh, was very successful. It gives an opportunity for the businesses and the job seekers to meet virtually. They can talk, you know, citizens can upload their resumes. They can, you know, actually have interviews in a, like a private chat room. 
um, they can offer them jobs and so that's that's been a successful format you know helps us get around you know having a bunch of people all together in you know one space so the premier virtual job fair um, is going to be on February that's the next one that we're hosting so we're encouraging sign up now for businesses um, and they can get the information at the workforce center to to sign up and of course we're encouraging all of our customers to sign up as well so that we can help make those connections so that's February 24th so um, the other thing that we shared with the uh, board yesterday was the Carroll County Workforce Development Organizational Chart and you know what we're here today to talk about too is some recommendations for some staffing some additional staffing and as we've transitioned uh, this last year to become an independent workforce area and stand up our own workforce board, that certainly takes a lot of other time from the manager, from Heather's perspective, to work with and manage the board, as well as represent Carroll County in the region and in the state. Um, we have a lot of direct reporting to the state now that we did not have before. Um, obviously, we have some new uh, grants, the new federal grants that we've received with the um, American Rescue Act plan grants and um, the, the Rescue Act. So we have additional funding for workforce training and all of that takes additional capacity to manage all of that. Um, as you know, uh, at 224 North Center Street, we have our American Job Center It's part of that network, that national network. And we have our local partners there that are housed with us. The Maryland Department of Labor has staffing and funds those positions. We have um, adult education from Carroll Community College there. We also then have you know, all of our staff that are working under these various grants. So traditionally, the uh, Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act has been the primary funding for you know, a lot of our positions, uh, uh, again, and also supported by some funding with the county. So as we look at economic development and workforce development, one of the key things, obviously with a lot of the businesses, and you probably hear it from them directly, um, is workforce. It's, it's just a top concern. You know, where are we finding the people? Where are we getting them? How are we training them? How are we keeping them? And that's, you know, a number one concern that we hear all the time. And so we're trying to address that with this additional funding. Uh, we feel that business services, we've always had a business services uh, consultant that's at the center, um, that's Scott Singleton. And so one of the new positions that Heather will be talking about is, you know, another business consultant to help us with that outreach, you know, to address some of the workforce concerns. There's a lot of money coming into the county, you know, through the workforce center, as well as through some of our other partners, the Maryland Department of Commerce, the Maryland, um, MEP, the Maryland Manufacturing Extension Partnership, that everybody has some of these pots of money, but it takes people <coughs> to help make it work to get it to the businesses. So that's why, you know, we're talking about some of these positions today and it, we feel that really, you know, the business services component is, is a, a big piece of that to help supplement what we're doing in terms of some of the outreach um, to, to the businesses and be able to enable them to be access some of this money, you know, some of the grant funding for the training and stand up more programs like, you know, the welding training and the CDL training and, you know, some of the other training programs. So I'll let Heather talk specifically about the um, proposal for some of the staffing that we have to enhance uh, the Workforce Development Center. Do you have any questions about the organizational chart? I know on the screen it didn't show. Um, the Department of Labor does have a dedicated um, veteran staff for disabled veterans and um, the veterans employment yeah. it looks services. Confusing to me, John, as long John, as you guys yeah. know what's yeah. going yeah. on with yeah, us. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the darker green are the positions under the specific Relief Act um, and Rescue Act funds that we're looking to um, add to our agency. Back in August you did approve positions, but as um, this is evolving, we do now have final rule for the American Rescue Plan um, Act funds. So we're coming to you today for some adjustments um, that we would like approval, we're seeking approval for. The first one is um, we have a youth specialist position that we funded under our initial Relief Act grant from the Department of Labor, which had a one year um, term on it 
we hired that position later than we thought as a part-time person, knowing that we would continue that position under the ARPA funding beginning July 1st, 2022. Um, that position is available due to some staffing changes within the organization, so we can advertise this youth specialist position, but it makes more sense to go ahead and roll it into the full-time position now that it's open instead of waiting until July 1st. Is that on the org chart? Pardon me? Was that on the org, org chart? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Chris, can you uh, down the bottom. put the org chart back up and leave it up so we can discuss it? Thanks. Okay. They're in that, what would you call it, a bright green color, yes. the ones right. that open the positions. Yes, the bright green. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> okay. down at the bottom, um, we had Eileen Vizella had filled that position, and one of our, our youth staff, our youth coordinator left, so she assumed that position. So that's what created the current vacancy. So what we're requesting is now to advertise that as a full-time position. I have the money within the RA grant, and then I have it moving forward under ARPA for the next three years. Do you want us um, to go one by one on this, or <laughs> are you looking at, what, what, what are you I'm looking at us doing? Yeah, just we do can, all. yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. And so, the next position we're asking for consideration is the reclassification of the um, business services consultant to a manager position. Um, Scott Singleton has been in that position. Um, his job duties have changed as Denise was addressing under operating as an independent workforce board. He um, is doing much of what the previous manager did in working directly with businesses but also under this expanded grant, we need to bring another business consultant in. Um, a lot of the work I see us doing in the next three years is really addressing the shortage of workforce and helping businesses retain their employees. So upskilling um, of incumbent workers. So we need more than one person on deck working with the businesses locally. And then the third position I'm looking for today is a contractual position. It is a um, workshop facilitator. And as um, an American Job Center, we need to provide basic career skills workshops. That includes um, workshops such as resume development, interviewing skills, LinkedIn as a way to connect um, with employers and the person that was filling that position through the state has retired and um, they have had running vacancies in our American Job Center for in excess of one year. So to keep that current, I would like to utilize funds that I have contractually to um, hire a consultant to run those workshops. So we'll have uninterrupted services to our job seekers. And that would be a part-time contractual yes. position. Well. One hours a week or something. Less than. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, you're not looking for any local funding. You're looking for filling positions. Correct. Well, um, since no local funding is is requested right now. Correct. Under it, under the business consultant, there is a correction. It's minimal impact. Um, that position has 10 percent local funding attached to it, but. Many times we bill the um, the grants for that, so we don't always utilize that money, but it is built into our budget. Okay, for the there's no local funding requested because of the money you're getting from the relief relief acts funds. Either what happens relief when act or our WIOA grant, our ongoing federal grant? Okay, so if the relief act funds stop, the positions stop, or is funding coming from somewhere else? So. I can lay out our funding a little better. It's very um, confusing. <laughs> we have WIOA funds, which are ongoing federal funds to provide um, workforce opportunity, innovation and opportunity um, funding. That's our traditional funding source. Mm -hmm. Then the State Department of Labor um, initially gave us 
what are termed rescue funds, and those were to be used over the course of one year. We have ex extended that so we fully expend them um, into 2023. Our American Rescue Act funding has come through um, not Department of Labor, but through Department of Commerce. So we are, or no, I'm sorry, U.S. Treasury. Yes. Um, that funding is, they're giving us it in two allotments. They give it to us this year, and we'll get our second allotment next year, but it runs through June of 2026. Um, the idea with that funding, it came directly to the workforce boards, not through Department of Labor. Um, it was an opportunity for the workforce boards to demonstrate um, the need beyond the prescriptive nature of the WIOA funds, which are serving those with the most barriers. So there are people that fall into gaps that may not qualify through the traditional funding sources. Um, it allows us to be um, responsive and timely in the services that we're mm -hmm. providing to our community, and it allows for the nuances and the needs in our community in workforce development. Over so 2026, what happens then? These could go away. That's what's my, okay, that's what I want to know. So but the funding goes away, do the, do the positions go away? Yes, all of our positions at Burke are grant contingent. Okay. We only, so if you look at our um, color chart on our org chart, <laughs> my position, um, our fiscal manager and there's an office associate position that are in sort of the tan colors. Okay. Those are the only three um, county positions. And then um, the business services consultant manager is 10% of his okay. money comes through local government money. The um, federal funding, uh, I didn't realize you were getting that, that's great. Um, the oversight of that federal funding is the economic development team. I mean, how how much is it and how is the oversight divided for the federal dollars? So the workforce board? No, 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 no. Is the, supposed uh, to oversee the ARPA. ARPA? ARPA? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's two point four million dollars that have, has come into our local workforce board. It comes through the county. It is um, a pass through through Department of Labor, even though it's not funded through Department of Labor. Right. So yesterday we um, talked about standing up a finance committee under the local workforce board, mm -hmm. and so that I left before that. Yeah, you did. Yeah. So <laughs> that would be part of their responsibility to do that. There's going to be an executive committee, a finance committee, and then a youth program committee. Uh -huh. So. That will be part of their charge and part of their mm -hmm. responsibilities. Um, as you know, we get monitored by Maryland Department of Commerce and you know the federal all the time for the WIOA grant, right. as well as we will continue to you know respond to those monitoring requests right. from the state for the the other grants as well. So but, yeah. there's definitely oversight and and mm -hmm. monitoring that's going on on a regular basis. The 2.4 million, we didn't. Have that oversight, did we? That went directly. That would, yeah. Those go directly to the workforce. That. That's in addition. Remember last week when Debbie Standiford mm -hmm. was here? Um, you know, we talked about the CRF money, which was you know about eighteen million we got, then about the thirty-two million from right. for um, the FRF. Uh -huh. But the county as a whole, including the transit grants, the airport grants, right. yeah. the uh, uh, workforce, workforce grants, mm -hmm. uh, other citizen services related grants that went directly to these agencies. Um, for very specific purposes, yes. um, are add up to I think it was like seventy million dollars that we've gotten. I'm looking at Corey, and she's nodding her head. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, about seventy million dollars in total that the county's gotten so far from federal funding. In, um, in, in so, so some of it was very very targeted, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and and for very specific okay. purposes like yes, this, and this is stuff. <coughs> yeah. And so we have to work, we have to um, obligate our funds by December of 2024, but we can expend them through 2026. June of yeah. 26. The, um, the, the organization design that the state provides you, I, I would expect has been there for a while. They don't change very often. Um, is it the right mix? Uh, is there 
other positions that you believe would be more advantageous to Carroll County from labor? Um, I think it's a good time to look at our agency okay. and, and look at possibly reclassification or what we need to administer funds. Um, it's very different than our WIOA grant. We've been given a large amount of money with a large charge to go with it. And um, we have to establish time and effort of our staff to each grant. Right. So by spreading it over three grants, we dilute the grants. So, mm -hmm. so in our due diligence to provide not only the best services we can, but to be good stewards of the, the funds, we need to really look at this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, and you, I agree that it's probably the right time. Um, I think the last question I have is, what else do you need from us at this point? Um, I appreciate the support you've given us so far. I mean, everybody is, I, I think we all feel the need to look at the workforce needs of our county. We want people back to work. We want to support our local businesses. And um, I, I just thank you for all the support you've given us thus far and being open to changes we need to make to adapt to the services we need to provide. Okay. Well, therein lies the challenge mm -hmm. because the four or five meetings I was at yesterday, the discussion is all about retaining <coughs> workforce, mm -hmm. and it's not happening no. at all. I don't care how much money we pour into these programs, mm -hmm. it's not happening. So while I think this is a great idea and it's wonderful on paper, somebody's got to come up with a way to stop the bleeding when it comes to workforce. It's in our faces. We've got over 70 positions just in the county. Mm -hmm. That's 7% of our workforce open. Fire and EMS can't retain. Right. College can't retain. It's, it's crazy. Look at the reason why. Well, what is that reason? We all say that, Dick, and we all talk about how great these programs are, but yet, there's no impact at this point. It's getting worse. Yeah, so I think we really need to dive in. If now's a good time to look, like you say, at the organization or whatever, let's do that because we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're losing the battle. We really are. And I, again, I applaud everything you do over there. As both of you know, I had a person that mm -hmm. was, was loving the, the youth specialist thing and did a great job there. Mm -hmm. How many of those folks were retained? I would venture to say not many. But some of these programs so, do work. I worked some, at some of them since do, 2000 on some programs, and they were very successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that times are changing, and we have to yeah. change with those times. So It I is, and it's is helping great. businesses adapt, too, and, right. and think outside of the box, think differently. What is the, the business culture? What is the culture of the climate that people are looking for right. and maybe adapt to that because it's not always money. Right. right. It, that's it, it's, that is, Heather. It, that, that's right. And right. Um, I think when you're, you know, under fire and you just need to fill positions, it's really hard to look at climate change and culture change, but um, that's well, really, yeah. I think, how to move forward. Um, and the county's a large employer that's yeah, going to have to do sure. that as, as yeah, well, and we're, we're not exempt it. from it. it. It's not just here, it's regionally, right. it's, it's globally. That, it is. That it's, just, it's a huge problem. And certainly, Commissioner Wans, if any of the entities or businesses that you're talking to have specific questions or needs, you know, please mm -hmm. let us know. We can follow mm -hmm. up directly with them. Um, you know, that is, that is very important. But I think you mentioned it yesterday, Commissioner Rossine, is that, you know, it takes people to okay. make things work and mm -hmm. that's why we're here to ask for right. some of these other positions and changes right. we're asking you to be flexible with mm -hmm. us so that we can move the organization where we need where we think it, we need it to be so that we can respond to these challenges because right. you're right it's not just here it's statewide it's mm -hmm. nationally um, there's many challenges there's a lot of moving pieces to it you know mm -hmm. a lot of it is looking at the labor market looking at compensation looking at culture you know, how can we help businesses do that? And that is one of the things that 
our business consultant does is say, okay, where are you with compensation and mm -hmm. you know some of these things, and he participates in the local you know, hum human resources um, committee that's here in Carroll County, uh, SHRM, and so, you know, we're in touch with, you know, those hiring managers and, you know, try to educate, you know, the businesses, okay, where do you need to be in this marketplace right now? Yeah, what, what I shared, you know, yesterday, um, and I tried to, you know, share yesterday, and I think it was received that um, there are changes. Um, we got to recognize, I, I didn't mention SHRM, it's a great organization. Mm -hmm. uh, there are others, you know, um, on the Governor's Workforce uh, Development Board. It is a very diverse board and is going to continue to be diverse to look at these challenges. Um, but, you know, there's no easy answer. I wish there was, um, you know, and you're, you're hitting it, you know, nail on the head, compensation, money, you know, benefits, location, work hours, three days of work, five days a week, seven days a week. Nobody has the answer. It ain't that everybody's gonna be, you know, teleworking, you know. They're gonna come back. That's not the answer either. You know, that's definitely not the answer. Um, so to, to sit back and say, well, this is it, no. It's, okay, let's figure it out. And, and if you, and that's why I brought this up, was if you believe your organization is set at this point to answer these challenging questions, that's great. If not, let's figure out a better design. I think I, I definitely applaud the uh, uh, Workforce Development Board. Um, I, I saw a lot of enthusiasm um, mm -hmm. and no backbenchers, and that's a good thing. You know, that's what you need. That's what we need in our community. Um, so th this is a start, mm -hmm. you know, uh, okay. and yeah, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Um, it, it's difficult. Cybersecurity jobs, there's probably 10,000 vacancies in the state. Mm -hmm. And over I mean, top of, if, are you, can I? Yeah. All right, thank you. And over top of all this, I think we're faced with inflation as a major factor in how people look at their jobs. They're losing mm -hmm. their consumption power, they're losing employment. Mm -hmm. They're looking at other sectors of employment that are accelerating their wages faster and they want to retrain, retool, shift over. So that's constantly mm -hmm. hanging over us. Things aren't as stable as they were financially. Things are more fluid and it's impacting all of us. Yes. Okay. Okay, with that, I'd like to move the Board of Commissioners to accept the changes and additions to the Carroll County Workforce Development positions as presented. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you, ladies. Good thank company. you, thank you. Thanks for your time. Hey, you guys put right. a lot of work in this. Thank you. Thanks. Come up with a plan to change the generation thinking right now. <laughs> That's what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. When Maybe you get that, come back. I know, okay? yeah. We'll be out of here. <laughs> Maybe change the older generation. <laughs> we need psychiatrists. That's called euthanasia. <laughs> okay, let's talk about electrical repairs and improvements to the Freedom District water treatment plant. Didn't we do these ones? <laughs> The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Utilities, requests your approval to award a contract for the electrical repairs and improvements at the Freedom District Water Treatment Plant to Eastern Sales and Engineering Company in the amount of $31,814.20. This award will be made via competitively bid term contract. The bid amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Good morning, gentlemen. As per the briefing paper, the Freedom Water Plant uh, is, uh, consists of two separate parts. The uh, new facility that was completed in 2009, that's where the, the uh, drinking water is actually processed for, from, from the lake into the finished uh, product. The second part of the plant is, is, is the old facility that was originally built in the, in the late 1960s then upgraded in 1981. The, the old plant, uh, several of the old plant's buildings are still used to, to, to process the effluent water from the new facility's water treatment operation. It, they also house one chemical treatment process and it serves as the workshop for the new plant. Uh, in recent weeks, plant staff has had to react to a significant issue with aged wiring and conduit as part of the old plant uh, uh, footprint. Interim repairs have been made at this time. Uh, th this item is for the permanent work and includes the installation of 200 feet of, of new three inch diameter conduit, clearing and reusing two and a half inch conduit, hand trenching in certain areas, 
and the installation of three runs of 480 volt three phase copper feeds and a copper grounding wire, uh, a copper grounding line. These improvements will, will allow the facility to meet all current code requirements and will allow the plant to, to continue to function in a, a reliable and efficient manner. Any questions? So the electrical tape's not working. We need to do something more. Is that what you're saying? Do the wire nuts. Okay, I'll move Board of Commissioners award a contract for electrical repairs and improvements at the Freedom District Water Treatment Plant to Eastern Sales Engineering Company in the amount of $31,814.20. Second. Got a motion, got a second. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, one for one. Now let's talk about purchase of a replacement grinder for the Sykesville pumping station. Yummy. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with Bureau of Utilities request your approval to award a contract for the purchase of a replacement grinder for the Sykesville pumping station to JWC Environmental in the amount of $31,273.65. This award will be made via single source vendor. The budget is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. The, 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 the existing grinder at the Sykesville pump station was purchased and installed in 2003 and is out of service and beyond repair at this time. It, it has been removed from the pumping station. As per the photograph that shows on, on your screen, the, the, the grinder is, is this device right here. And its main purpose is, is to pulverize the, the waste stream into a fine slurry as, 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 the, as the sewer uh, comes into play. The, the, the right photograph shows an, an, an above view of the grinder actually installed. The sewage waste flow in this picture comes in from the bottom of, of, of the screen. It goes directly into the grinding wheels and, and, and pulverizes the, the wastewater stream. And the, um, the primary uh, uh, benefit for this process is it eases the wear and tear on, on the pumps and extends their overall service life. And the, the clogging uh, uh, aspect is, is also curtailed quite a bit. <laughs> this item is only for the purchase of the grinder. Bureau staff will, will actually do the installation work itself. This grinder model has a, an expected service life of 12 to 15 years. It is the same model as the one that, that, that was taken out and matches several others in use at, at, throughout our collection of pumping stations. And as you are aware, there are plans to upgrade or, or replace the Sykesville pump station over the next several years, and we, we, we will transition this new grinder into that facility. I see some welding in there. There is some welding in there. You're going to take a tour and oversee this? Uh, and have lunch afterwards. Undersee it is what you would do here. Yeah, it's down there. Wow. Have they improved these grinders, Andy? To the, you know, we always hear uh, in another community I'm familiar with. You know, you, you don't put this down the. Oh yeah, the get commodity. down the pipes. You know, <laughs> please don't. Are, are they? Are we to the point where these grinders are taking care of that now? If and I'm glad I ate breakfast before this <laughs> conversation. So anyway, if, if the flow reaches the grinder, the, the uh, grinder will, 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 will pulverize it. The the issue with flushing certain right. items in your right. in your household is the, the small lateral line that goes from okay. the house to the main yep. is where the tree roots come in and right. volume occurs. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's, that's the main issue. Yeah. Everything so has like, limits. Yeah, well, that, that, that message needs to keep going out there because yeah. that, you know, we... That, that's where all the snakes, yeah. the snake and the pipes and stuff mm -hmm. come in because they're, ver they're um, yep. horizontal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, well. Now, when I uh, went in for a meet, I had uh, American Water was my contracted uh, water facility and I remember going out there and seeing these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll move the Board of Commissioners award contract for the purchase of a replacement grinder for the Sykesville pumping station to JWC Environment Environmental in the amount of thirty one thousand two hundred and seventy three dollars sixty five cents. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Any discussion on this grinder? All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Now let's talk about approval of a change order request on contract 20 Tech R Tech 1 2020 Hot Mix Asphalt Paving. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. So you have heard uh, Chris and I up here and others many times um, 
talking about using the right method at the right time, and that is why we're here before you today with this change order. We have an opportunity to change our practices a bit, and uh, Chris, if you could get into exactly what we're planning. Thank you. As part of our pavement and evaluation process, it was recommended that the county utilize another pavement rehabilitation strategy, mill and patch only. Strategy is not new to us, as we mill and patch base course routinely and then overlay roadways. Uh, where this project is different is we're only going to be milling and patching the failed area areas on 15 roadways and not immediately coming back and overlaying the entire roadway, just the area that we patched. Um, some of the patching may require some subgrade to be removed and replaced also. Um, the roadways we've identified for this project have a low percentage of patching compared to the overall square footage of the uh, pavement, making them ideal candidates for just the patching method. Um, patching will um, the failed areas will prevent them from continuing to grow. Uh, increasing that would increase the future repair costs and, and will also provide a better rideability for our motorists. After these are patched, then we'll determine whether or not they're um, appropriate candidates for other preservation strategies such as smooth seal, chip seal, microsurface, or, or a thin overlay. In some cases, the patching may be sufficient um, to get the roadways along. Um, we've identified a diverse sampling of roadways to evaluate this. Um, and we continue to evaluate all our repair strategies, as Doug mentioned, to achieve the right strategy at the right time. The funding we're planning to use is savings within our 20 R1 2020 Hot Mix Asphalt Paving Project. C.J. Miller of Hampstead has agreed to perform this work as a change order to the existing project in the amount of $722,408.00. And they anticipate they're ready to start this work as soon as the weather is suitable. I think this is a great idea. <clears throat> also, I'm bringing your attention, I'm sure Commissioner Lance has heard it too, with the rehardening of the gravel roads. We're having failed spots. Will we develop a potential program similar to this to address those needs or yep. somewhere in the future, if I can be brief or Commissioner Lance, so we can listen and, or give something back to our constituents to sure. appease them? Yeah, we absolutely will. With regard to our surface hardening of the gravel roads, you know, when we came in uh, to look at that, we realized at that point that whenever you do that everything requires a certain amount of maintenance mm -hmm. but i think if you look overall uh, we it's have heard from our customers that they appreciate the reduction in dust uh, in general it keeps things exactly uh, where we were told but we were under no misconceptions that we would go through a winter yeah. time and not have to yeah. deal with a pot right. just like a pothole in a mm -hmm. regular blacktop road um, so we absolutely are developing strategies with our roads team who will primarily handle that to, to make sure that we go back on those roads. Well, I'm looking forward to briefing on that and maybe yep. do a site vis visit with you. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, with that, I move that the Board of Commissioners approve the change order to the existing purchase order with C.J. Miller, Inc. in the amount of $722,408. Second. Okay, I got a motion and got a second. It got a good haircut by Mr. Brown. All Thanks, in favor? <laughs> aye. 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 Look, look at that oh, okay. haircut. I, I wish I could grow hair, but I seem to be politically <laughs> challenged because my forehead continues to grow. And <laughs> You'll save money on the, the haircut. Say, be very careful here. I didn't say nothing about you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting wonky. I like, the, I like the shine. Come on up, Mr. Deggetts. Let's talk about 2022 Land Preservation Park and Recreation Plan update. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I need to say I'm very impressed that you got through that whole thing. Land, preservation, park, and recreation plan. Um, we're constantly <laughs> referring to it as LPRP, L-P-P-R-P, and uh, it is quite an effort to go through this and, and update it. But I want to give a board an update on where we are in this process and where we'll be going next. Uh, as you all know, every year we get program open space funding from the okay. state of Maryland. That is one of the major sources of funding for our capital budget. Uh, it can be used for park, parkland acquisition or development. In order to get POS funding, we have to complete a land preservation park and recreation plan every five years. So we are now in that cycle of updating the plan. The last one was done in 2017. Uh, Virtually everything that's in this plan has appeared someplace else previously, whether it's a county master plan, whether it's capital budgets for the county, for the towns. Uh, a lot of this is collecting that information and packaging it in a format 
that the state can review and then they will also get this from every county in Maryland. They incorporate this into their state uh, land preservation park and recreation plan. And they're on a slightly different schedule from us. I believe it's two or three years ahead. They'll be working on their next update. There's three main components to the plan, recreation and parks. There's a natural resource component and an ag preservation component. So a lot of what we have done is update the figures from previous reports. Uh, in the case of parks, we've had some new park acquisitions, a uh, two acre property on Hapes Mill Road, and 145 acre property north of Tawnytown. We've had some new parks that have been developed and opened. So we've updated our inventory to reflect that. And we've gotten a lot of assistance from the Department of Planning and the Department of Land Resource Management. So I wanna make sure that they are recognized. We really appreciate their support. Uh, in particular, Sandy Baber, who's a godsend helping with the maps. Uh, some of the mapping for this, when you're looking at radius around different park sites, this is way beyond what our staff is capable of doing. We don't have the equipment or the expertise. Sandy was great to work with on that. Uh, Will Brosey in our office worked on the inventory and did a great job with that. Uh, Brenda Denny helped with the natural resource information and J.P. Smith with the Ag Preservation. So we're very grateful to all. Uh, we will have a summary of the goals included in this plan, what efforts we've made uh, to achieve those goals for the county, how they are consistent with the state goals, and uh, showing progress on what's been done since the last plan. One of the things that's new this year is that uh, the state has asked us to have the municipalities more involved in the process. So we've done some things differently this year. We've included all of the town CIPs as they relate to parks. That is included in the plan, uh, as well as how we work with them. As you all know, we take some of our program open space funds each year, allocate them for town projects. We also help fund the match that is required. Uh, we've also reached out to the town with a survey uh, with a number of questions regarding park development. Do you have enough park land? Are there areas where we can work together? And that was some valuable feedback and the results from that survey are also included in this report. Uh, some of the metrics for many, many years, the state used one metric to see if you were meeting your land acquisition goal. And that was if you had 30 acres of park land or park and recreation land per 1,000 residents, you've met your goal. And no one at the state could remember where they first got that idea from. It was one of those things that gets institutionalized, was used for years. Uh, they then realized that it was a flawed metric because for Carroll County, if we had 30 acres of park land or that much per 1,000 residents, but it was all located, say, in Detour, we're not serving Eldersburg or Manchester or Westminster very well. So there is still a metric of how many total acres do you have, but now they have incorporated park equity and park proximity. How far do you have to travel to go to a park? Are neighborhoods that may have different demographics or income levels, are they treated well in terms of where the parks are located? So that is a part of this report as well. Uh, as far as the proximity goes, over 99% of the residents within the county are within five miles of park and recreation land. That includes county parks, town parks, and school facilities because we use them for recreation as well. The only area that is outside of that, it's approximately 45 homes in Lineboro. So that tells, <laughs> that's pretty specific. And that's where Sandy comes in with those maps. It was really helpful. But uh, that's an impressive number, and I think that along with our acreage, which is well over the 30 per thousand, we're at about 46 acres per thousand. And then also the equity issue. Uh, the state has a park equity mapper program that you can use, and we pulled up a score for the entire county, with Carroll County. We have the highest equity score in the state of Maryland. So every area, even when you get into the subgroups and the smaller areas within the county, everything scores very highly. So I think a combination of those factors, the total acreage, the equity, and the proximity suggest that we continue to, to meet our acreage goal. And we have done that since 2006. Why is that important? Because if we have not met our acreage goal, then the POS money that we get from the state 
50% would have to be used for land acquisition and 50% would go into park development. As it stands now, we're able to use 75% for development. Uh, there's still a 25% requirement every year <coughs> to go towards land acquisition. Is this by accident or is it your leadership? Good luck. Let's, let's go with that. Good luck. And, and frankly, your decisions to help purchase some property in some key areas, the Hapes Mill property and the Tawny Town property that were recently purchased, that contributes to this. So mm -hmm. I appreciate your support then <coughs> and the support of past boards that have really put us in this place. Well, we can't make those decisions collectively unless you're out there collecting that information and bringing it to us. So thank you and your staff. Thank you. I'll be driving around Lineboro later looking for, for sales. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to be putting this draft report on the website. It'll be up on our web page around noon today. So public will have an opportunity to review it and to take a look at it, have further comment. We got a lot of comments from them on a couple of needs assessment surveys that we had. We had listening sessions held in two different parks. Uh, we also had it available and open for comment online for about a month last year. So we received input from more than 2,000 people that was considered as a part of the development of this plan. Uh, we've submitted the draft to DNR this week. They will take somewhere between 30 and 45 days uh, to comment on it. They'll get it back to us probably around the end of March. And then we have between then and July 1st to submit a final version to the state for their approval. So we're on track to get this done. And <clears throat> excuse me, as I said, it's a lot of work and it's not the most exciting work. It's not the most exciting document to read, but uh, it is necessary. Obviously, we need to continue the ability to use program open space funds. And the last thing I'd like to share before I open up to questions, a lot of the larger counties, when they undertake this effort, they're hiring a consultant to do this. And they will end up with uh, several hundred pages <clears throat> in this report. Our report was about 100 and 101 pages. It's all done with in-house staff. It is actually an eligible use of program open space funding to hire a consultant to do a report. Uh, personally, I have an issue with that. With the limited POS funding that we get, I would much rather see it used to buy parkland or build a park than to pay for a report. Mm -hmm. So we work through it. And again, with the help of the other agencies, uh, I think it's a good report and it'll be out there today for public viewing. I'm sure it'll be more exciting to read than our CIP budget. Well, we have a page in there, including the CIP, and how do we get there, and you know, what's the thought process behind it? Have you used um, community college or uh, McDaniel? Uh, we have not in the past. Yeah. Uh, this year and the previous report in 2017 were the first years when DNR took the lead on it at the okay. state level, which then resulted in, in Recreation and Parks taking the lead on it locally. Yeah. Previously, planning had. Uh, been the driving force behind it. Okay. Okay. Well, why we have you in front of us? I know that there's potentially three sites for kayak and Union Bridge, Haps Mill, and 140 at Monocacy. Eventually, I want to be briefed on where we're at on that, mm -hmm. like construction, open them up, and also since <coughs> this is my last year, hopefully, I can do a uh, kayak launch with you at Double Pipe Creek since COVID had kept postponing it. But I really love for us to potentially get there a group of people do a little bit of publicity and give some public awareness that that ramp is there because it seems like it's underutilized and needs a little bit of publicity. So if you want to get a group of people from Rec and Parks together and launch, I'd be more than happy to go out there and do it with you. That's a fact, beautiful stretch. Ed Singer mentioned this to me. He said he really wanted to do this, and I'd love to get out there with him. Well, Ed and I had talked about that in the past, so I'll have to reach out to him. Thank and you. in the spring, the water's a little higher. I know that during the summer, it dries up and drops, so an opportune time would most likely this spring, at least, at least when the weather gets warm. Yes, when it's a little warmer. And now's not the best time to go just with temperatures and water temperature. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm -hmm. any, any, any questions? No. Okay. Sounds good. Thank All you. Right. The good Great work. job. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. And I have a second kayak if any of my colleagues want to borrow. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about psychological testing Commissioner. on fire and EMS. Mr. Robinson. It's Mike, Mike, and we have a public commenter first. Okay, well, they can come up. Oh, well, then their backs too. All right. 
It's up to you. Speak to the back of your head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gentlemen, you can you can look behind you and see the public comment. Of, okay. Okay. Mike, while you we have a public comment. Yeah. Yeah. So my my name's uh, Michael Carolink. I'm president of the Carroll County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics. Uh, it's great to see Commissioner Wance uh, wake after a late meeting last night and all that. <laughs> that I slipped out of, by the way. But that you know, is lucky you. Uh, you a lot of good know. conversation, but that was that was a long one. Uh, I don't know how uh, the director got back down here in a timely fashion this morning, but um, you know, I just wanted to come in and say real quick, it's, it's the, I guess, the the positivity in us moving towards the hiring process in earnest. Uh, you know, with this, with you know, what he, the director's bringing to you this morning and otherwise, you know, us pro our progress towards the transition uh, of employment moving towards fire and EMS uh, department of fire and EMS is obviously important to us operationally and <coughs> as employees, uh, being able to. Really support our families, be be able to continue to serve Carroll County. I guess just the the one thing that I would continue to urge and and do so publicly is as we move towards this uh, the hiring process is that the commissioners um, maintain a commitment to the people that have been serving you in, as career staff already. You know, the, keep in the back of your minds, I guess, or even the forefront of your minds for for that matter. Um, prioritizing that commitment to the people that have been serving you for so long and enduring so much. I mean, whether it's the surge or all the other things that we've experienced so far this, through this, uh, you know, I, I think the worst case scenario would be arbitrarily disqualifying someone who's been a dedicated servant of this county for, for years and whatever time frame before. I mean, we, we do have career staff that have been serving this county for, for 20 plus years. Um, that's that's really substantial and they've endured a lot and uh, we hope to see their faces you know continue to serve Carroll County um, so it's just that I just want to like you said the voice our our pleasure with seeing this move forward and, and getting closer to that hiring process and getting this transition underway and if I just have the latitude real quick to just say something about the next item real quick while I'm here mm -hmm. uh, we stand in firm, firm support of the new uh, new vehicle uh, director Robinson has done a great job and uh, we don't want to lose them to the Jeep so uh, we look forward to that as well. So, all right, that's all I got. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think. Okay. Now let's go back to the psychological testing services. Sometimes I feel like we need it all. Okay. Go ahead. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Department of Fire and EMS requests your approval to award a term contract to Atlantic OcuPsych Inc. to provide psychological testing for employment candidates for fire and EMS. The testing will be, will be provided at a cost of $400 for each evaluation. The Department of Fire and EMS is estimating up to 100 candidates per year will reach the psychological testing stage of the hiring process for an estimated total amount of $40,000. The contract will be issued through a Delaware State contract that was competitively bid and the amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be needed. And just to provide a little clarification with this, um, as a standard practice, um, we intend to emulate the process of some of the other jurisdictions in the region, which includes psychological testing. Um, the particular uh, contract we're uh, going to be using, um, we did an interview of that individual. Uh, he provided us with samples, which is a fairly reliable predictor of employee success. It looks at uh, areas of past history it looks at um, the ability um, to perform under duress and it's probably similar um, to what the commissioner rothstein's used to in the military the same type of things it does some profiling and it has a high degree of accuracy in uh, determining success uh, so this will be part of a multifaceted process that will ultimately have about eight steps to it um, in anticipation of hiring uh, for the next fiscal year, we want to get these things in place so we can start as soon as we're able to because it's going to be a multi-month process and we're already, um, you know, one year behind essentially in getting the people on board. Will they be uh, retained for, um, you know, other activities, psychological activities and assessments, you know, um, after events occur? Yes, there, there are options in here that we would probably have to come back for, but they do things such as fitness for duty mm -hmm. and other related products that they offer um, that would be consistent to public okay. safety person. But like PTSD and other yes. type of 
Yes. Um, have you talked with um, the sheriff and the tools he uses? Yes, okay. and um, we looked at the sheriff's person. We did uh -huh. do some follow-up with that, but uh, basically this person has the most experience in the region with fire and EMS. Okay. <coughs> the people that we've hired already <coughs> before you came, did they go through this process as well? No, no but the, the, cur the current employees are actually employees of the respective volunteer right. departments. So uh, it would be, I'm not familiar with what each department was doing um, beyond probably a basic background check. We want to make sure the people are vetted. Now we're not going to backwards. No, no. You know. uh, well, what will, what will happen, uh, there are people that are current employees of the volunteer companies because they're not county employees. Right. They would go through this process. Okay. To bring them on board. I mean, it's a good opportunity. It's a good opportunity for them as well. Yes. You know, yes. I mean, if you, you know, em employees got to recognize the value of this. It's not right or wrong. It's understanding you know, their self-awareness. Right, so. and because we're gonna be hiring people that are, they're, they're not specifically incumbents, but they're experienced, some of them for decades, right. they may have underlying issues that um, may be a challenge to employment with us. So we wanna make sure that we've looked at all those elements. And uh, there's, as I said, there's a lot of reliability with this firm. He provided us with samples and what they're actually uh, measuring. Commissioner Wentz, you have any thoughts and ideas on this one or is you it? Know, I think it's it's spot on mm -hmm. and, and it's the best direction and it's a great step in getting us to where we need to be. So Did you go through this? Well done. I'll refrain from curious. answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> when do you anticipate your I first hire? <laughs> uh, well, depending on, and, and as you know, I'm going to be meeting with you all in several weeks, um, depending what's decided and what happens in the budget, uh, we plan to advertise and begin the process prior to whatever is approved. We know f for certain that we will be hiring people. So uh, in speaking with the county ad uh, administrator, uh, we can advertise and start the process. So that was the, the purpose of this. I hope to, yeah. we've been working on the job specs and the classifications with HR on an ongoing basis. So I would hope to advertise um, no later than late April, beginning of May. Okay. And the, the unpredictable <laughs> part of this is we have no idea what the response will be to our advertisement. It could be a handful of people, could be as many as a thousand people, uh, because there's a lot of job boards and related things nationally that this will be advertised, and, and I think it'll be appealing to a lot of people. Okay. Great. And there's a lot of people that are gonna come into play here, Mike, when it comes to steps prior to the psychological testing you're going to have yes. to have proctors mm -hmm. for written and and correct physical ability and so right all those we're things setting up this whole plan here yes so. and all those other areas will come before this because of the cost associated with this um, this will actually occur after the occupational um, physical Director Robson, I want to compliment you on establishing such a great working relationship with our Sheriff's Department. <coughs> you did a very good job. I hear good things about you. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. I move the Board of Commissioners <coughs> award term contract to Atlantic Psy uh, OcuPsych Incorporated to provide psychological testing for an estimated amount of 40000 a year. Second. I got a motion to second anything to be discussed. Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now let's talk about uh, Thank you. an SUV, a 2022 <laughs> Ford in Interceptor SUV. The Office okay. of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management Warehouse Operations requests your approval to award the purchase of one 2022 Ford Explorer Interceptor SUV from Apple Ford in the amount of $55,141. The purchase is being made through a Maryland state contract that was competitively bid and the amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be needed. All right, commissioners, uh, as we discussed last week, this is our last opportunity to buy these vehicles. This one being for Director Robinson and the Department of Fire and EMS. Uh, the price that Eli stated uh, includes the vehicle along with all the upfitting necessary, um, uh, which consists of the storage compartments, lights, sirens, everything. Um, again, these vehicles uh, still have a six to eight month delay. 
Uh, so with your approval today, we would expect it sometime mid to late summer. <laughs> okay. So you got the Jeep till August. <laughs> well, <I didn't. laughs> uh, my, my only question, I guess, uh, is, is the same one I asked last week when we were ordering for the Sheriff's Department. Uh, should we not be ordering a few more of these? Because I know in anticipation of, of, of uh, you know, a plan that I've seen and that we'll see here eventually, that puts that off a little bit. We, we got to have vehicles to put people in. So yes, we're going to be um, hiring the EMS officer and the training health and safety officer hopefully by the end of April. And both of those people will ultimately, as part of their duties, they will require vehicles. Um, there's no money currently, so I didn't put in for that, but we are developing a six-year vehicle plan, and so my vehicle will be the template for the subsequent administrative people that are hired for their vehicles. Um, the one thing is, is that the EMS person, that vehicle will double as a backup uh, EMS supervisor vehicle. So when our shift commander comes on and we've got to put him down for hours on end to administer discipline or whatever, my EMS officer will have a vehicle that'll be equipped to respond. So ultimately we're going to buy two more similar vehicles and uh, we uh, will have that need and it'll be an almost immediate need. Which is why I'm asking yeah, the question. Because I know it's not a line item on our budget right now but because of the challenges we're seeing yep. in the industry I just don't want to have somebody riding around in something that's not efficient enough for what these jobs require so I'm here today to say why not look ahead and order three of these instead of one if that's what we need today and if that's what you're anticipating today yes, absolutely. Uh, I, because of the Again, because of the, the way in which the length of time it's taking to get these things, uh, I, I'm here to, to entertain uh, the notion that, that we should find an additional whatever, 110 or 100 and whatever it is to get three of these now. Did I just hear Director Zaleski fall out of his chair? <laughs> what what well, are listen. your thoughts? You're, you're about to say something. Um, uh, well, Director Robinson said we are working within our budget. Um, if you would like us to do okay. something like that, then we understand. But yeah, there I are options to buy vehicles off lots. Uh, the only thing is if they're available at the time. Appleport of Columbia, who we're ordering this vehicle from, we can buy stuff off of a contract if they have it on the lot. But yeah, with, with the shortages of the vehicles, that's just it's something that you do want to take a chance on. Yeah, it's a crazy market right now. The well, shortage is expected to run through the end of 22. Yeah. Yeah, and that's going to keep pushing everything back. Yeah, exactly. But so, I just got notice of that a while ago that this chip shortage and all the other issues or supply shortages are supposed to not right. to be the end of 22 before we see clear out. Mike, well, your, your anticipation is that you, you will be requesting these yes. vehicles in the budget. Correct. And the, the, the need for these vehicles will be as of... Um, let's just say May of this year 2022 so we wouldn't be able to order them until the next FY 2024 uh, budget so it would be over a year away and we'll have to so you know I, well, I, I apologize I, I agree with you I mean safety security quality yeah. of life uh, I those think are three we, pillars I, I think we should uh, I, clearly we have some monies available I don't know how the that all that works, but uh, we, we can't authorize the purchase until after we've transferred the money. So we um, really would need to have. Yes, I would fine. suggest we have a, 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 a. We have to, you know, to do this correctly. Open meetings and everything wise, that we put it as an agenda item. We transfer the money and well, from reserve for contingencies okay. or wherever you want to take it from, and then um, and then. And then authorize the purchase. Is that going to next week's agenda? Is that going to mess you up? The absolute latest deadline for the forge is the twenty third. So I believe that's next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I understand the open meeting stuff. I get all that. I'm a big. You, well, you know more, how I am with that. Well, and more. Oh, not, not more importantly, the budget. Related. Well, I understand that too. Um, but I'm. I, 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 
this, we got to do something. No, I agree. The, the topic is to purchase the vehicle, so I don't think, you know, I, I, I mean, it is a stretch if we're going from one to three, but it's still within the topic of purchasing a vehicle. So I think we can cover that. What do you think, Tim? <laughs> and and your, your shade of red is there, but as long as it doesn't turn blue, we're okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, the public is, if interested public would be tuning in to hear about the purchase of uh, vehicles, emergency before the emergency, uh, fire right. and emergency medical. So therefore, going from one to three is not that big of a stretch in the open meetings at this point, I think. It's hard to imagine someone saying, oh my gosh, I would, I would have tuned in if, if I had known it was three. But right. <laughs> but now what we need is um, budget <laughs> to come in here. That, uh, yes. To Trying to get Ted. Work okay. us For somebody. through the yeah. process of transferring the budget dollars and then executing them. My, my guess so is he is not in the building. Let me let me see if I can literally. Very close okay, to thanks. Doug, get Doug. the Ted. Hey, hey, thanks. Hey Doug. Hey Doug. Hey Doug. Ryan. We're not going to get the <laughs> Yeah, I just think, I, and I hate to I hate to put a I, I hate to put a put, you know put a little complication in this, but and I wouldn't do this ordinarily, but every day, I mean, every time you guys have been in here, it's the same old story. Well, we're six eight months out. Well, if that's the case. I think this is extenuating circumstances here because we are developing our new fire and EMS department and we need two more. Yeah. And uh, we can't wait till May to do it because then that means we won't get them till December. Who, who are you trying to convince? You got us? You had us in Stop selling? Room. Okay, I'm waiting on the. <laughs> We're just waiting on whether we could do it process wise. <laughs> exactly. Okay, I'm going to stop out. selling. He, he, he I am? Yeah. You're, You're not up. nodding off over there, are you, Weaver? <laughs> I will state that if Mr. Burke turns blue, nobody's volunteering to give you mouth to mouth. Okay, what? Is somebody going to be coming in? Hopefully. There should be someone, yes. Un unfortunately, Ted is doing a, a chamber luncheon talk today, That's so right. I'm assuming he is gone. But yeah. someone else in the budget office can answer the questions. Okay, okay administratively, um, and we're just going to stand by. For this but administratively if we can look at the summary of closed minutes from uh february 10th yeah i have a correction. dealing with uh, land acquisition i have a correction on that okay hold on well never mind nicely done doug <laughs> three, three vehicles instead of one yes yes and where the funding would come from yes okay um, we have 1.5 million. Is this on? It is. Yeah. Okay. We have 1.5 million of net new funding in the fire uh, line that the transition didn't start. So we have funding. Um, we would just need to normally what we do is we uh, pay for it out of fleet. But at the end of the year, those charges end up going into the to the individual line items anyway. So what we could do is have fleet purchase them and then just charge it to the fire line, and then we wouldn't even need a transfer, okay? okay. M much easier, so your motion is to? My motion is to purchase three <laughs> 2022 Ford Explorer Interceptor SUVs from Apple Ford in the appropriate amount, uh, whatever that is. I, I'm not that good with the math, uh, so you guys do the math, so. Did, and wait, what, did you already do them, it, Doug, or what? One, one of them will come out of this and two will come out of fleet, or how's it going to work? Right, well, so so the only thing I want to be clear, uh, Director Robinson has said that one of these is going to be configured a bit differently. So that's why your, your motion yeah. is great, because it may cost more, well, it will cost more for cabinetry configuration right. for an ALS vehicle right. than a supervisor right. vehicle. Right, so I'll, I'll leave that Perfect. open yeah. okay. with, with no specific yeah. price tag on it. But I'll leave the motion open just to the one plus the two. And does that cover? Y'all, you're good? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'll second that motion. And I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, forward thinking of this. And like I said, safety, security, quality of life. We're hitting it. Any further discussion? Good job, Mike. Seeing here, none all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Well, I sincerely appreciate uh, the commissioner's cooperation. You're and doing it. Unexpected and uh, thank you very much for understanding what our 
position is in our direction. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done so far. <coughs> Director, great. you get a chance to treat the sheriff to lunch sometime. He's a fan of you. Okay. Uh, as I was sharing, uh, thank you, Mr. Karolanko, as well, for coming in. Um, looking at closed minutes from February 10th uh, on land acquisition. Commissioner Weaver, you had a... I, on the uh, page where the minutes are there, uh, the board director staff to prepare. Uh, I can't. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> but I, I didn't think there was a set number in there that they would come back with. Uh, no. Come back with the number. If they go with that number, you just wasted your time. I think so. No, we said. I that thought number. it was to be flexible or come back with a. I, I my understanding is that was the number we had discussed. I think it was to see what the response would be. Yes. Based on different, the, but the response was to see where where they could come together. I thought it was just going to be at that set number. Yeah, yeah. set number oh, plus. Wow. Yeah, with, with the stipulations underneath it. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from closed on uh, February tenth. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You good there? Uh, yeah. Okay. All we're doing is approving what was said. Yeah. Um, okay. Whether we agree with what was said is a different story. Uh, I, it's not the way I intended they were written. I yeah. I misinterpreted what okay. was on that then. Um, uh, uh, open it well. What's your name? Chris, <laughs> do we have any uh, callers? No callers. Okay, thank you. Anything for open admin? at this time okay you'll cover it in agenda items so I'll, okay I'll speak then come on up good morning good morning, good morning. okay for february 21st Bless you. the office is closed on Monday, don't get near me. What did you say? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Office is closed on Monday in observance of President's Day at 6.30 p.m. Commissioner Weaver will have at least three in the town hall, but hopefully more than that in attendance to town hall well, North I get Carroll it. High School. Yeah. I, might be yeah. done. But <laughs> I may attend. I don't know. Uh, Tuesday, February 22nd is the state of the county. Um, address and as was shared now it will be attended by at the Carroll Arts Center Commissioner Frazier myself Lance and Weaver on Wednesday February 23rd is MACO uh, subcommittee along with legislative committee Commissioner Wance and Frazier will be in attendance and then that afternoon in the Reagan room which is room 003 we will be doing a joint board of education uh, meeting with with us, <laughs> the Board of Commissioners, um, <laughs> and that starts at 4 p.m. On Thursday, currently we are scheduled uh, to have a closed and open session. That may not occur uh, due to looking at the items, and we may be able to get away with not having open session on Thursday. Right. The, um, um, the, the uh, transportation plan does not need the public hearing, um, so that item is definitely going away. <coughs> and um, Linda can move the consolidated transportation plan to the following week. And um, no one has uh, no one has any. So um, it's my recommendation: we do not have open session on Thursday. We have a full agenda on Tuesday and then the joint meeting on Wednesday. Are we going to have a closed session on Thursday? There's yeah. no need for closed. No, There's okay, because you said open. Yeah. I, to make no, sure. I, I appreciate it. No, no closed, no open okay. on Thursday. Are we good with that? I'm good with that, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, Friday we got nothing, Saturday we got nothing, and I am so looking forward to February 27th where I will provide the podcast. On Commissioner. If I may, before we go on to uh, the next week, for the joint meeting, um, last when we had it originally scheduled in early January, I guess it was, there were several agenda items um, that the board wanted. 
um, the Board of Education has has provided you know a lot of that um, to you in writing, and um, and so a lot of those things probably are no longer necessary. Um, I asked. Um, if anyone had any agenda items, and I haven't heard anything um, so far, so are there any particular agenda items you want? We had had um, previously um, partnership projects between Career and Tech and CMC and the Board of Education, future capital renovations, uh, budget stuff, um, BOA efforts with other county entities, um, superintendent search, student enrollment figures, um, staffing update, and the South Carroll redistricting committee. That was what was on they the need to agenda present previously. Their, partial, their budget as they yeah. presented it. I think they need an explanation. They wanted to discuss. I'm sure they want the budget, budget items with yeah. us. That seems to be yeah. on the they, um, South. It's unfortunate that they're calling it South Carroll redistricting as opposed to Carroll County school redistricting. They've had two meetings to date. I think they're having a third on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Just before. Uh, just before. So uh, definitely would like to keep that as an agenda item because mm -hmm. it's a, uh, a high interest item, you know, at least I know in the southern part of the county. I also think that the things that we're asking that, that be communicated, they may have written to us in response, but I think the public might yeah. want to hear what they yeah. have to say about it. Well, I mean, the just for us. The two they're suggest of the ones that are on here, the two that they're suggesting not to have are is the first one, which is agreement on partnership projects between Career and Tech and the CMC, and uh, the staffing, the CCPS staffing. They're not having any staffing issues any longer. So yeah, but I'd like them to say it. I, I'd like oh. to hear about that. Okay. Yeah, I would too. I find that a that's little bit challenging. Especially when it comes to the nurses. I mean, yeah. you, you said that there were two more nurses that left. Yeah. I, I, and yeah, I would like an update on their staff. Yeah. So, so to see where they are. Yeah. yeah. And so you want to leave it the same? Yep. Yeah, the agenda the same. Yeah. And I think that's a great idea, yeah. Dennis, because they responded in writing for us. That's great. But yeah. you know, we're there, and I'm sure the public, at some public, will yeah. be in. Accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. To get things we out have here. no closed on the 24th. Transparency. We do not. Can you okay. see that? <laughs> closed and open is canceled on 24th. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I just let them know. Okay. Thanks. Now, after I've been interrupted, but not rudely, but just interrupt. On Monday, February 28th, we have nothing on March 1st. March. Wow. We have a long-awaited and looking forward to the Charles Carroll Community Center groundbreaking, where all of us will be attending. And, and then, let me just mention ahead. one thing, because it remains a thorn in my side. Social media. You know, we put something positive on there that is, I think, tremendous. Of course, I would, but it's not just tremendous for that community. It's tremendous for our county. We're adding another building uh, that's going to be utilized by people from all over. And to get some of the negative crap that has been put on there about the ugliness of the building and, you know, why are you doing it on a Tuesday? And come on, people, can you just give it a rest? Give the negativity of social media a rest. We truly need that in these times. Just stop. Sorry. No, I appreciate. Often I say, why not just say thank you, and uh, yeah, and move on. Um, I am looking forward, uh, and actually, it's a beautiful building, and uh, looking forward to serving a community that you know you've been pushing to serve and continue to serve. So, we have a, a dinner and discussion with Westminster at 4.30. It's an early dinner. On Tuesday, March 1st. Do we know where that's going to be? No. Raise and I think hand. it's still tentative. It's where? We don't know, oh. and I think it's still tentative. It's a place called Tentative. It's a, yeah. it's a neglected it's a great new restaurant. restaurant. <laughs> right. I think we need Fraser's to find out soon whether we're having that or not because we've, we've asked. I have another obligation 
that I might have that I I can get out of, but I need to know. Let's because someone else has to go if I'm not there. Yeah, Kathy's already asked, and right. we're waiting for their response. Okay. On Wednesday, March second. Uh, your house. <laughs> Yeah, we can still do it at his house. It just won't be. Uh, Mako uh, Tax Subcommittee and Legislative Committee, Commissioner Wance and the Fraser team will be down there on Thursday, March 3rd. We will have closed and open session. Uh, nothing at this time is scheduled, but we will fill that agenda um, <coughs> on March 3rd is what I would expect. Yes. We will see. Friday, March 4th, Town Mall of Westminster is doing an anniversary ribbon cutting with Commissioner Frazier uh, attending. I take it you'll be the keynote speaker? What, could, what, what <laughs> is that? to attend and he's saying he's speak. What, what is that exactly? Do you know? It's like a rededication, I think. It's, it's how many years? I can't remember. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so they're, they're, they're just re-upping yeah. the yeah. energy of the mall. Right. Yes. You, you're going to have to know how many years of your keynote speech. I'm sure I get some information you before opened it. March 4th. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. oh, oh, oh. That's good. Uh, Mr. Burke had his hand up. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, Commissioner Wance, uh, with the weather warming up, is, is it a good time, maybe March 3rd, to put on the new and improved uh, possible noise ordinance? If, if uh, you want to discuss that briefly and introduce that and see if the board is interested in proceeding to a public hearing? Are you good with that, Commissioner Weaver? Depends what it is. <laughs> what, 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 what'd you say? <laughs> no, I would like that. Yes, we need to get that. The, the, yes. We'll, we'll talk about it then. Uh, but I, yes, let's get it on. So now and we get it out of the way. An we'll agenda see item. <laughs> it's just yes. a, just an agenda item. You're, you're deciding whether you want to uh, go ahead with it or not, or right. keep the I, one you have. Yeah, I think we need. To, yeah. And also the transportation plan that we're not doing the week before. Yeah, that that should be moved over. Right. Yeah. It will be. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's easy to move the transportation plan. Mm -hmm. now we gotta have a session. It's okay, mobile. I hear it's mobile. <laughs> now that I was That's rudely okay. interrupted by Mr. Burke, I'll continue. <laughs> Saturday, nothing, and Sunday, Commissioner Wance will provide his wisdom in the podcast. Is it's there anything that I've missed? I mean, if you're providing wisdom, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I'm anything <laughs> I missed in sessions, Wanda? No. We're good. Now let's uh, go into closed. A motion to go into closed for. Sorry. No, we've got to say board four. Four first. Four land is the land acquisition. Land acquisition. Yes. Okay. Now I need to a motion to adjourn after. Wait a minute. Closed. We got to vote on that. Oh. We got to vote on that. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Pardon me. Who seconded that? Weaver. 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 Commissioner Weaver. Thank now you. Now I need a motion to. Motion adjourn. to, to uh, adjourn after closed. Second. Got a motion and got a second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Against? No. Four one.